Okay, so three, two, one. Janice, second round. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> a bit of a technical problem there. But um, yeah, um, lovely, lovely having you on. Um, I, y y as you mentioned a little bit earlier, it was a little bit of a surprise. Yeah, I mean, because I definitely didn't expect, I mean, to be honest, I, um, I thought this was like a tech thing. So yeah. I was like, huh. Well, I mean, I'm I'm honored to be to be on it. Um, I just hope I have interesting enough things to say. <laughs> oh no, but I mean, as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, I, I had I had a, I, I met with with Lester in Central the other day, and and you, you came up in the conversation, and it turns out that uh, uh, he holds your opinion extremely high uh, when it comes to food in in Hong Kong. Um, he's, he's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but then after looking at your website and you know, look, you're actually a, a really a fundy. <laughs> maybe maybe you can sort of go into into um, mm -hmm. uh, what it means, like you know, um, you know what you're doing. Like you you you're, you're judging food. You're doing. You, you're well, you're part of it. Yeah, you know, I think that, that's what a lot of people think when I tell them I'm a food writer. They go, oh, so you go to restaurants, you critique, you you know, is that your is that what that's what people think, or mm -hmm. either that or they think I'm a recipe writer, mm -hmm. you know, cookbook mm -hmm. writer or something. I'm not really either of those. Mm -hmm. um, I do sometimes review restaurants. Um, it just depends on like if a if a publication comes to me and says um you know we need some reviewers um which i do for example for like um tatler in hong kong every year generally speaking i don't know about this year but every year they publish a, a guide to um really good restaurants and they need some opinion on it they need people to go out and eat and talk about um what makes it good or bad or um uh, yeah so i do that sometimes but that's like I don't know, less than 10% of my job. Like most of the time I'm, if I'm writing about food, it's um, things like trends, um, interviews with chefs or mm. with like other people in the food industry. Um, it could be like going to a farm and figuring out what they're growing and why, um, because these things are relatively rare in Hong Kong. You know, we don't, Hong Kong imports more than like 90 something percent of our food. So um, farming is something that I'm really interested in. Um, and I'm interested in like why people do it, what they're growing, what challenges they have, um, that, that sort of thing. So it's like stories around food, um, but it's really, I mean, I always say food is, is is culture it's so much more than just what we put in our mouths like it tells if you look at a plate it can tell you a lot about the place um the person who people who made it you know where things come from uh, it's it's so much more than just like going to a restaurant and go i like this i don't like that um you know this pizza was great it's it's more much much more than that yeah mm. it's my world <laughs> oh okay uh, uh, but you're also you're also the founder of this uh was it not a tongue Tong Chong Street, Tong Chong Market. Street Market. Yeah. Well, so, what's the story there? So yeah, like I was saying, I'm really interested in farming because I just like look. Everyone has to eat, right? We yeah. we're not at the stage where we have some kind of magic pill that we can pop and we don't need to eat anymore. Everyone needs to ingest food. <laughs> so whether you like it or not, whether you take pleasure in that or not, it's essential. So I'm always interested in like the food ways we call them food ways like how does food get to you and local farming has always interested me because um because for a city like hong kong that is so reliant on international trade um why it sounds weird to us but like why do we grow like why or did we ever grow our own food were we ever self-sufficient and could we ever go back to that? Like that's always, that's a very sort of interesting question for me. And that kind of took me on a journey kind of, um, I, it started by, from, a, from researching just one particular story. And I found that there are farmers in Hong Kong and that they were trying to basically regenerate farms. So farming had not existed in Hong Kong for, not, basically not existed for since about the 60s when everyone left farms and started working in factories. You know, Hong Kong was well known for textiles, for example, or electronics. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, they all flocked to, the, uh, to factories rather yeah. than, and left the farms just as wasteland, basically. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it had been taken over for other uses. So mm -hmm. some have become just 
plots of land that are untended to, others worse have become sort of dumping yards mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. old cars. Sometimes they've been redeveloped for building mm. and the um, real estate de- developers have been trying to change the zoning of particular like, of agricultural land. And there's always been this argument that, you know, we don't need to grow because we can import everything. Hong Kong is, you know, mighty importing port. Yep. Um, and yeah, we are. But then there were some people trying to start farming again and they were farming in a way that is environmentally sustainable, like organic and also looking, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but really Mm. it's like they were looking after the soil for future generations. Like that's the idea of sustainability, right? So I was really curious why they were doing it. And also I was curious, of course, as a foodie, I was really curious about how it tasted. Um, Because soil quality in Hong Kong really varies. Um, Soil is surprisingly something that requires tending to in order Mm. to remain productive Mm. and to produce delicious food. So that's why I visited these farms and then I asked them, well, it it tastes good, so where can I buy your stuff? And they're like, oh, not really that many places. Like back then, like quite a few years ago, they were, there was like one government, one or two government farmers markets. They were very rudimentary. And I thought, well, let's try and put put a market in the city. And I grew up in Melbourne, so Melbourne has tons of farmers markets, has a really strong, healthy culture of that. And in Melbourne, it's really easy. You find a school that has a car park that's free on a weekend. You ask the farmers to come. Everyone brings a table and a tent and off you go. Not that way in Hong Kong, as I soon found. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) land is hard to come by in Hong Kong, so... um, it took a while like researching and trying to find out where we could actually put this market Mm -hmm. finally ended up finding um tong chong street so swire properties owns it and they were very generous with um they they really believed in the a need or a interest at least in a farmer's market so that's how it kicked off so how did you get the contacts with with uh with swire i mean was it just it was really, um, I mean, Hong Kong is a village sometimes. I yeah. mean, I, I was actively looking and I was a- asking everyone I could. Mm. At that point, um, because it, I'm in food, I know um, some like communications people at Swire Hotels. Yeah. And Swire is a huge company. And obviously they didn't know someone directly, but um, had a friend who very kindly looked through her company directory and said, maybe you should try this person. And neither of us knew her. We just kind of found, literally found her name in a phone book. Um, so just, you know, cold calls, um, emails. And it took a while, but I mean, it took a couple of emails, but then um, I think the idea was sort of interesting enough that they got back to us and, and yeah, off we went. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I, I recall one of the, one of the features for um, Melbourne was those markets. Yeah, like the tomatoes are exploding yeah, yeah, yeah. in your mouth, and and um, I haven't actually gone to the Tong Chong market, but is it a similar sort of experience? It um, so in Hong Kong, it's a little harder to just be farm farmers produce only. Right. Um, I think Hong Kong Hong Kong people are more used to a sort of entertainment Mm -hmm. value. They want entertainment value in so-called events. Mm. So we have like, you know, Hong Kong has excellent malls, shopping malls and things, air conditioned. And you know, it's summer now in Hong Kong. So you know that being outdoors is actually a bit of a task. Um, So we had to make it really attractive and give people a reason to keep coming back. So Tong Chong Street actually has tons of um, cooked food as well. So we work with, um, we source and uh, ask people to apply um, that are startups in the food world. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe someone who has just opened a restaurant or a takeaway joint or someone who maybe just has a concept and wants a proof of concept at the market. Yeah. So, 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 so what's happening now? Are are, are restaurants actually using? Um, this is great. Yeah. So, this so it's good. been going on for quite a while. Um, so, we basically are. I mean, I wouldn't say we're like an incubator for startups, but it's definitely a an, an platform for startups, food startups, to try and try, test the market out. What kind of startups are there? Well, I mean, every like startups, as in not tech startups, but more like um, earthy gr- uh, restaurants. You know, restaurants. Yeah, oh, okay, just okay. Anything from so 
basically back in the day, um, there's a restaurant called Little Bao mm -hmm. um, that is now pretty famous, I think, in Hong Kong. Um, and they do like these steamed baos with like really funky Chinese-ish um, fillings. Mm. And it started as a stall. Um, at the market and then now she's uh, they've opened like a few restaurants around town um, actually yeah so so that's the that's the goal kind of for us is to help food entrepreneurs have a platform to test the market out mm. and and then hopefully expand further and start their you know journey in the F&B world yeah so F&B food and beverage. Well, yeah, okay. I'll uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I think one thing about physical markets and food is something that is very difficult to put online. Like it's, you can say, okay, you can do deliveries and you can choose something, you know, on an app and it'll d get delivered to you. Yeah. But if you want as an entrepreneur, like on the flip side, as a business owner, if you want instant feedback, yeah. it's very hard to beat that face-to-face -face experience. And literally someone will, you can see from the minute that they get the food from your counter, you can see their reaction. How does the presentation look? Is it good enough? Or are people sort of puzzled by what you're giving them? Mm. Is, that the, is that what they envisioned from the menu? Also, from an operation standpoint, they can check that their processes work on, in the back because at a market, everything is live. People come, they pay, they expect their food within a certain acceptable time frame. If you can't deliver, there's a problem with your flow and you've got to re-look re at your operations. So that's, that's something, like I think that's a really useful experience for um, a lot of entrepreneurs who are trying to start a, um, a food business. Because food, food businesses are difficult. Um, the margins are usually quite slim because mm -hmm. um, it also requires a lot of labor, but also the ingredients, good ingredients are not cheap. Um, and also once you're outside the market environment, you need to pay rent. So you, it's a good place to test it out. Mm. Oh, I see, I yeah. see. But it it sounds like you you're more than a center of gravity, <laughs> because <laughs> well, because you've yeah. also got you've also got the, the the sort of the magazine the you know the yeah, publications yeah, the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it all kind of works together. Yeah, it's so kind of like a vortex. If you look at so I give out a when people give me a business card and I give one back. You know, it's a very Asian thing. My card just says food. It has my name. Mm. It has my email address, and it just says food because that's my job description. That's as close as I can get to my job description. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I write a bit, I do events, I do, um, you know, I try and do these like movement type things that are, you know, help like sustainability and food. And I just, yeah, it, basically my world is food. And if it's something I can help with that's related, mm. I, I will. And I, usually I, I'm really happy to like, try new things as long as it's to do like my expertise is just food in general like yeah. it can be anything from tasting food to see whether it tastes good or whether i think people will like it or up to like um thinking up new pop-up ideas for a space like say someone has a space for a couple months and they go what can i put in there i can like and sometimes i can find people who can take up that space or um think up a concept that might work i mean Obviously, it's not just me alone. This usually, I, I kind of rope in people that I think will help on each project. Mm. That's kind of what I do, and it's also, I think it's also a, a feature of being in Hong Kong. Like I say, Hong Kong is really a small village, mm. especially in this industry in media, English-speaking media, and in food. These are these are very small communities, actually. And once you know a few people, you immediately, by extension, know like, you know, 50 more people. And mm. those 50 people are kind of your major, like probably move like 80% of, like 80% uh, of the movers and shakers. So it is really, it's nice to be part of this community, but also if you stuff up, then everyone knows. <laughs> how, how so, how so? Well, I don't know, if something, if you do something and it doesn't work out, um, and oh. it's, well, I don't know, I, I personally, I haven't, I don't think I've done any major stuff ups. I don't know, maybe people are talking behind my back and saying they're out. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I haven't done major stuff ups, I think. Hopefully. But there, <laughs> yeah, but there have been instances where I was like, okay, I wish, cause, because I'm, I'm, I'm always doing new things. There's stuff that I've never had experience in before. Like doing an event, for example, I did a fine dining event 
at um, at Taiku Place as well. Mm-hmm. They have an art space, mm-hmm. and they try to. Well, the event was about integrating fine dining with um, fashion photography. So we wanted it to be a very immersive experience, um, and it was completely new for me. So I learned a lot, and I learned, you know, how to. There were so many people who helped, um, you know, the caterers who actually executed the thing. My role was really just to coordinate all these people, and kind of my food knowledge was kind of took a kind of a back sort of um, role, like. But the food kind of helped in that I understood what was going on. So if people said, "Okay, I need a, I need to sous vide this piece of meat um, for X amount of time," and then I I know to ask like, "Well, we need electrical plugs or something because that's an electrical oh, like yeah. way of, yeah, or yeah. we we need to make sure there's a safe and stable space to put a water bath because that's what a sous vide is." But it wasn't really it wasn't me going like, "I like this food, um, it should go on the menu." It wasn't like that at all. We had a consultant chef. Um, he was a very ex- experienced person. We also had an excellent catering team who executed that th- that vision. Um, my role really was just to pull it all together. And sometimes it's scary, but then I also think that that keeps my work very interesting because if it was the same, like if I had to sit in an office and just do the same thing over and over, I think I would I would slit my wrists. <laughs> but food really allows me to branch out and do these sort of food adjacent things or food right. related things. Yeah. Yeah. Have you have you thought about opening your own restaurant? I know enough about restaurants that like I say, margins are razor thin. And I think the restaurant industry attracts really interesting people mm. that I love to dip in and out of, but I'm not I'm not quite there. Like if I were to be super honest, like a lot of kitchen people are crazy in the best way. Mm. Like they're like artists, like people who work in kitchens work crazy long hours. Cause if you think about, for example, if a restaurant opens for lunch and dinner, mm. they're not just there from like noon till eight. They're there from 8 a.m. prepping, mm. like doing all the chopping and washing and receiving deliveries, sometimes even longer. And then they, t- in order to open at 11.30 or 12 to serve you your lunch, and then lunch ends at maybe 2.30, 3 if you're unlucky. And then you've got to prep for dinner. Dinner opens at like 6. Now it's earlier because of the COVID restrictions. Um, but, you know, it means that you have zero, you have such little downtime. It, it really requires a certain, like you have to be passionate about it. Yeah. Or yeah. you have to be really desperate for the money or something. Yeah. And I, I really admire that, but I, I would never be able to do it myself. Like I just, I don't think I'm made for <laughs> right the for, long for hours. That kind of like, I mean, it's not just long hours, but like I can write for hours on end. Mm. I can sit in front of a computer if I had to, for days to like write articles or, I I don't mind walking like going around town to like interview people nonstop all day. Like that gives me energy. What doesn't would be to stay in one place and try and like dish up perfect dishes every time for customers who and actually customers uh, for customers who are not always appreciative i hate customer service like (laughs) because i mean because there is a whole spectrum of expectations spectrum of humanity everyone i think expectations are the number one thing to 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 nail down when you open anything that's customer facing from food to any like service to a product because if someone looks at a menu they read, say, um, I don't know, a a banh mi sandwich, okay? Like Vietnamese sandwich. Okay. Like, you know, the baguettes with um, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. some pate inside yeah, and yeah, some yeah. salad. So if they read banh mi, that's what they're thinking. But if you, for example, if you're going to be creative about this banh mi and you're going to, I don't know, fry the bread and put it in a donut, you can't call it just banh mi. You have to explain it properly or even have a picture on the mm. menu. And that's all of this is to manage your client's expectations. Some people surprisingly don't know this. They think, oh, I'm going to call it a banh mi because that's what it's ex- inspired by. I mean, that's great. Then write inspired by a banh mi because this is not what most people know. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of level of detail is something and knowing the customer that way surprisingly does not come naturally to a lot of people. 
And then that's when you have complaints. When you don't, when your expectations don't line up with yeah. the end result, that's always when you get complaints. And then that's the hard part. Like, how do you deal with a, a, a customer who's not happy and then goes on social media to like, to pan you and or goes on open rice and goes like gives you one star and a sad a sad face that these things drive business or can drive business away mm -hmm. so if you're already operating on such it's like your heart you pour your heart and soul into something like a restaurant and then someone gives you like a sad face on on open rice that hurts like that's i can see why like chefs and restaurateurs take negative reviews very personally and i wish they didn't to be honest because it's just like it's just some nobody from the street who cares and even if it was like a reviewer quote unquote it's one person yeah like so but anyway it does affect it does in some way affect people's businesses and it's a hard um you know if you're looking at this stuff every day and if you don't have enough confidence in what you do or you don't have enough experience in what you do it will make you doubt yourself and it will, you know, you beat yourself up over it. Mm. It's, it's super hard. I could never do it. Yeah. Um, if I really wanted to own, like open something food and beverage related, it would probably just be like a bar where I pour people like neat, like shots neat. <laughs> like don't, this is what, this is the bottle is what you expect and the bottle is what you get. <laughs> and maybe I'll add ice, but then some people are really nerdy about ice too. You know, <laughs> how big it is, what, oh, you know, on. whether it's crystal clear. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. There's all that and yeah. i mean that maybe i'm maybe even that's gone too far yeah. so just shots for everyone yeah whiskey neat that's it <laughs> now, now you, you you've you you've got another foot in new zealand now yeah what's the story there are, how are you going to continue your your are you going to diversify maybe maybe what you can do is like a b2b kind of scenario where you is that, is that well, what, what you, do you what, what, what's your suggestion what's this b2b no, no i don't know i don't know maybe you like so bring in, yeah. i think the great thing about writing is that you can be anywhere as long I mean these days we're all connected like all mm. I need is an internet connection even for writing cuz you know it's not like I'm sending videos or anything even like a crappy internet connection is not too bad mm. like it, it works so I can write from anywhere and actually a lot of my stories for publications in Hong Kong were actually travel and food stories for like that I've been on like on trips overseas so, um, so yeah, I, I can write about food from anywhere, really, because, like I say, everyone eats. So everyone mm. has a food story or food stories to tell um, that you could, like, go to Italy and every village in Italy has, like, something different about them. Or there's some kind of lost technique that would be really fun to talk about. Or, I know, an ingredient. Like, I learned that they're in Sicily they cook the leaves of the um, zucchini plant mm. and it's like its whole other name it's they get it's called tenerumi and it's like a ve it's a vegetable it's eaten as a separate vegetable altogether and it tastes amazing like i think i like it more than zucchini and, and you never hear about this in hong kong because it's such a it's like a, a very peasant kind of ingredient yep. so a lot of times what gets imported into hong kong is like the high value stuff because they they need to justify the the logistics and the shipping. Mm. Um, so Tenerumi, I had never heard of it until mm -hmm. I went to Sicily, yeah. and it's are like. You, are you a bit cold, by the way? No, I'm fine. Okay, I, I'm, I'm freezing. Oh, I so, think it's because the yeah. aircon's right above you. Yeah, <laughs> I just need it. I need to kill that. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, so this uh, the, the zucchini plant, and then you, okay, in Sicily, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you there are always ingredients like every every country every geographically ev mm. just by nature there are different ingredients because of different climates because of different soil types mm. because of different cultures that have plant like you know agriculture that is the actual word agri culture so it's the culture of the people that have brought a certain plant um certain species to a certain area there's so there's always unique things to to say about ingredients um and that's where i always start because you can you cannot make a good meal out of bad ingredients that's just it's impossible um that's why i always start with the ingredients so if somewhere has like a really strong um, farming tradition or if there are like vineyards it makes it super in, like doubly interesting um, obviously in cities 
that's where most of your high-end restaurants and stuff are going to be. So that kind of food writing is more like a travel guide usually. Um, you know, um, if you land in this, you know, land in Sydney and here are the 10 restaurants you should go to. That's more like a, we, we call it service journalism. So you just kind of, it serves, it's service to, to suggest where people should go and eat. Whereas in say Italy, it's usually, and especially if you're talking about far away places, um, remote villages, you're really, people might not visit, but they will enjoy reading it as a, as a sort of armchair travel mm. Um, mm. thing. So that's, and you can like literally do that from anywhere, um, even during like lockdown or, mm. or even social distancing you could talk about food at home. Like there's so many, um, there's, there's actually, because we have to eat every day, there's always something to say about food if you're mm. interested mm. enough. Mm. Like, cause if, if you don't think about it, then it's like, oh, okay, you know, I'll eat a burger. I'll, you know, I'll just pick up mm. whatever. Um, they'll deliver it to my house, I'll eat it. Um, and yeah, and, and it can be boring if you don't want to think about it. But if you want to think about it, even like if you want to think about a fast food burger, you can you can trace you can try and trace it. Where does how does the bun get made? What's what are the ingredients in it? Because they I think in I don't know in Hong Kong, but in some countries it is now um, essential to list out the actual ingredients in ev even in um, like fast food, just like you would in packaged food. So you'd find that in a bur in a burger bun, you think there's like flour and water and yeast. No, there's like stabilizers, there's um, cornstarch, there's all sorts of other things to make it soft and fluffy and also last on the shelf for a long time. And if you want to look into further into that, okay, so, you know, why do we use so much cornstarch and stuff now, even if it's something that you think should be made from wheat? Well, is it's it because corn in America is subsidized. So oh. everyone wants to use corn to make everything from sugar to flour substitutes to you know, everything like you look, go, if you go to a supermarket and look at the ingredients lists of things, you will almost not like you, everything has something made out of corn in it. Um, especially American and I think South American products where corn is subsidized. And that's this whole other story of like political power and lobbying. And that is, and people think that's not food. But it is, it's corn, like it is literally food. It is a staple. Um, so you can, you can delve into food from anywhere um, mm, in mm. the world and any topic almost. So what are the, like, okay, so I believe corn syrup mm -hmm. is high another one of the- corn syrup yeah, is high, very contentious. And it's not very good for you, is it? No, yeah, I think one of the criticisms of corn, processed corn, um, is that it, um, so high fructose corn syrup, I don't know, my science is not super straight here, but um, it's something to do with um, like raising insulin levels and also causing inflammation mm. um, beyond what is normal. And it's very difficult to, um, it, it causes people to gain weight um, without actually giving them nutrition. So that, if you look at obesity rates in America, apparently it has a lot to do with high fructose corn syrup and it's ubiquity in everything. Like you, you know, definitely in um, in fast food and definitely in soft drinks. There's just tons of it. And in even in things like ketchup, you think ketchup's tomatoes? No, it's mostly sugar. <laughs> it's mostly, yeah. And some, sometimes that sugar is corn syrup, depending on the manufacturer. And even when it's not corn syrup, it might be like beet syrup or, um, it could be cane sugar, but cane sugar is a bit more expensive, so that's unlikely, unless it's a high-end ketchup. So the cheapest stuff is always subsidized uh, staple products that mm. um, governments have chosen to subsidize. Gosh, it sounds pretty nasty. Yeah, I mean, the, the industrial food world is really screwed up. Um, a lot of us don't realize it, actually. Like, you know, you walk into buy a packet of cookies from the supermarket and you think oh it's like cookies just like how you know if i make cookies at home no <laughs> it's yeah. like has so many more other ingredients that you could never buy off the shelf yeah. um it has like all sorts of like gums and stabilizers um things to replace like things uh, so butter for example is quite expensive so people will use other shortenings like palm oil or um what else like vegetable oils 
vegetable oil is an interesting one because you see it listed on a on an ingredients list and you go what is that vegetable it could be anything and the fact that they don't have to list that is kind of testament to the sort of commercial kind of the the effect of lobbying i think a lot of these industrial manufacturers don't want to be that clear don't want to be transparent mm. about what they put in because they want to cut costs um so i think that's why we have all these really opaque um ingredients lists and and like i don't know like but they're all like really cheap products as well and we don't talk about that enough in food in food it's always like oh how's this restaurant how many michelin stars does it have is it on the world's 50 best restaurants list i mean that is one side of dining but it's like you're talking that that's the kind of dining for like the one percent maybe five percent including the people who are you know aspirational eaters yeah. i would say but the bulk of the food world is industrial food no one talks about it and that's that's starting to happen a bit more now because they're I think right now the world in general is coming to this, you know, time of reckoning and that's happening in food as well. People are questioning the injustices or the um, the problems in existing systems, such as like the subsidies, um, such as like labor concerns um, at, for example, at, like tea growing plantations where there's basically slave labor, yeah. meat packing. Um, Companies in the U.S. I think at the moment are under the spotlight because there's a lot of COVID cases there, and they're asking, you know, what is it about these these working conditions that have caused so many issues, and you know, why don't these people have health care? Are they, you know, illegal? All of that is coming to the surface now. Yeah, yeah, you, you like you mentioned that it's it's like the the palm olive oil. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the yeah so like the palm deforestation oil. Associated exactly with all yeah that. so like um past couple of years um there's been really big fires in like indonesia for example um and it's caused these big smoke clouds to float all over indonesia and into singapore yeah. as well which is in a similar situation to hong kong in that they import most of their things so for them to have that's that's a stark realization that their choices have something to do with this big cloud of you know black smoke over their city yeah. um in the amazon like the amazon has been burning for a couple of years basically i mean ev right now is the dry season mm. L this time last year it made the news for quite a while um and this year they're saying it's burning as well so the rainforest is being um so it's like a man-made disaster, basically. They've gone in to burn the rainforest because they want to clear land so that they can put cattle on it, so graze cattle on it. For your 99 cents burger. For your, exactly, for yeah. your 99 cents like Brazilian beef burger. Um, and that's it, that's like people are like, oh, but food is becoming so expensive. Um, like it should, like some people can't afford to eat expensive food. The whole thing is, is messed up because we are paying for this in an like there's these are the economic externalities of having cheap food someone's paying for it someone's got to pay for it we've gone through this time where growth economic growth has been so amazing for maybe since the 70s and 80s but actually a lot of these problems like wastewater rainforest um uh, burning down rainforests these things were not calculated in this growth because these things were not business costs. So the business didn't have to pay for smog over Sao Paulo or, you know, or Singapore. Mm. They think that it's up to the government to clean it up. But the government didn't create this disaster. And they also didn't ask the businesses to clean it up. There's this whole, it's really like, you know, when I say it that way, it's like, it's obvious that it doesn't line up. But for a long time, that was business as usual. You know, you make your cheap food and keep destroying whatever and burning down rainforests and killing like monkeys for palm oil while we get cheap food. And that was always kind of almost like an accepted trade off. People like governments almost would be like, oh, yeah, that's how we will feed our growing population through cheap food. But now we're paying for it in a very real way in like all the environmental destruction. And that's that's coming to a head because that's not just affecting you know 
people who care about, like Greenpeace or something, right? It's affecting us now because, for example, coronavirus is a zoonotic disease. A lot of these animals have come, have come out from destroyed forests and had to mix with us, like with, with human like in civilization. And that's how, you know, these diseases happen. So this is a direct result of us taking advantage and not not mitigating the and not facing the problems of over extraction. It's yeah. I, I think we've gone really far, but th- that's food. That's that's what food is about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite troubling. Like when you start thinking about it, it's quite it is quite troubling. Yeah. But it's hard to make people realize because where we've you know, within our lifetimes, we've always been in this place, like in the world where food is generally speaking abundant. Um, you can go to a supermarket and buy anything you want, fill your tummy, be very on a sugar high. And, you know, that's that's kind of the, the machine we're in. So mm. to say that, okay, we're gonna take this away or your cookies, because we're gonna make them more ethically, we're gonna we'll pay, pe- pay people the right wages, we're not going to use palm oil. We're going to use real butter. Suddenly, you're like, okay, your cookies got, have gone from five dollars to fifteen dollars. People would be are outraged. I mean, and so I don't, I don't have a solution for this, but I can tell you that that's that's what has to happen, basically, mm. in order to fix this, because we're all dying. Any like we're all having these chronic diseases from bad ingredients, industrial ingredients, plus it's destroying the environment. It is in every sense of the word, not sustainable. Mm. So if we don't do something about it, or if people don't realize where it's like the apocalypse is here, basically. Well, talking about the apocalypse, I mean, one thing that's, you know, one, having Hong Kong being a place which imports what a large percentage of the food 90 no, 95% 95% much. you know like uh, as the saying goes you know you're only 3 meals away from uh you know blood on the street kind of thing mm-hmm. and um yeah having 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 a larger uh, group of um Hong Kongers out here in Hong Kong uh, 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 busy growing and and doing their own sorts of things it makes it a lot more sustainable. So, what 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 are the what are they growing? What are the, what's the? Um, well, a lot of it. I mean, most of the growing in Hong Kong is either vegetables or poultry. Um, so you get local chicken, which is mm. a hit with everyone at the wet markets because they don't like uh, in Chinese culture. They always like Cantonese culture. They always want freshly killed <laughs> chicken um, so having local chicken really helps that um, vegetables you get um, you everything from your really regular like choy sum to um, things like strawberries mm. that you wouldn't expect to be available in Hong Kong um, strawberries are an interesting one because people especially from Europe associate it with a sort of spring sort of um, season mm. but in Hong Kong it's in winter that we get to harvest um, strawberries because Hong Kong is so warm that our winter is like a European spring so um, or summer even. So actually we can only grow and strawberries are quite delicate because as you know, it doesn't really have a protective, a sort of natural protective layer like an apple has, has a peel, but um, strawberries don't. So they could easily be eaten by pests and things like that. Mm. So without these natural defenses, um, cold weather actually helps them a lot because then you have less pests roaming about and they're hibernating. So yeah, in winter, that's one of my favorite things actually, Hong Kong grown strawberries. And the advantage of having them grow in Hong Kong is that you can pick them when they're ripe, not three weeks before and then having them be on a boat or whatever shipped over. We've been flown over. Yeah, I recall um, back in 2004, I was, well, 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 I was in Taiwan at the time, and we used to get on scooters and go to these like strawberry farms and yeah, with, like, exactly. And Taiwan and is and, so good for that, actually. That's Taiwan, fantastic. they still have that culture of farming. Like yeah. there are so there is not a huge amount of land, but they have a lot of respect for um, people who grow things. There are always. Like people are connected to the land somehow. They'll always know, even if they live in the city, they'll probably know someone who's a farmer mm. or you know someone's aunt and someone's friend and friend of a friend. 
it works at a farm. And that really helps because one of the reasons, going back to the farmer's market, why I started it was people have forgotten where our food comes from. And when you forget that, when you lose that connection, you don't care anymore. And when you don't care, there's no way that you'll pay more for a better product or or you'll care about how it's grown. Um, you might care about how it tastes, but that's like, that's not enough. You need to, you need to know why, if there's a, an apple here that costs $5 and another apple that costs $45, why is that? Like if you don't have that connection to, often a personal connection, for example, a farmer that you become friends with or just someone you recognize the face of, it makes a huge difference. Mm. So I think that's why markets, that's why I love markets because they, they put a face to a name, literally. So why do Japanese apples and these, and these you know, the, the top end stuff, um, my mum came out and we decided to get a Japanese peach. She nearly fell off her chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When she when she heard how much we paid for yeah. it, well, why are they so so damn expensive? So Japan is a slightly different case in that okay. people become very like a lot of the farmers are really good at what they do and they're very obsessive about like certain strains of say a peach or something, and they invest a lot in in like select uh, in growing the best like maybe they grow say they grow like a hundred trees and only and each tree has 10 peaches they don't sell all those that 10 peaches because not all of them are perfect in their minds with the perfect sugar level for example or the perfect texture or the perfect size so they'll end up selling 10 percent like one out of every 10 peaches on a tree that's one of the reasons why it's so expensive but also the investment that they put in to create these like as perfect as possible peaches so, and also in Japan, there's a culture of giving peaches or giving, giving fruits as a gift. Oh. So that's why they strive for this perfection. Cause you know, in Japan, like packaging and visual things are very important. So um, because there's this gifting of fruit sort of culture um, and that, you know, you could get a box of perfectly lined up peaches that just look like, they look almost like they're cakes, you know, they're yeah. out of a mold. And that is that could be a very expensive gift, and that's what people might give each other for maybe New Year or you know a business contact or something. So there's that market where people have a budget for these big things, because it might not be like I think, like it wouldn't, for example, it wouldn't be like uh, an expensive watch or like because that's that's probably like too personal or it could see, be seen as corruption. I don't know what like mm. exactly the culture, but I know that there is a culture of gifting very expensive fruit. And when you're gifting, it has to be perfect. So people will pay the price for that perfection. Top dollar, top dollar. We don't, well, it's not, that, that culture is not so much out here in Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, I mean, people do, uh, uh, do give you, like Do you think it's just baskets? opulence? Do you think Hong Kongers yeah, are just like... I mean, Hong Kongers are an interesting bunch, I think, because we have now become quite accustomed to paying a lot for food, for like good quality food. And yeah. in a way, I mean, that's there's this weird inflation that's happened in Hong Kong over food as well. I don't know. I think that's more of a currency thing, but... But I don't know, people People have, when people have expendable income in Hong Kong, I feel like they do spend a lot of it on food. Um, and things like gift baskets of fruit are sort of a thing. I mean, not as much as Japan for sure, but it is. And, and also the, if they're like peaches, for example, that taste amazing, like they taste almost like candy. Sometimes they're too perfect for me anyway. I, I'm, I'm a bit scared when they, they're like too sweet. <laughs> um, and but people love that they're like oh i will pay like three times the amount in order to get that flavor because maybe they'd get another peach from somewhere else that isn't like maybe an australian peach that to me will be like oh it tastes like a peach it's slightly tart it's also sweet it's not like perfect in shape but it doesn't matter it's all the same when it goes down your digestive tract um so but for some people it matters like they're like oh i don't like it when it's too tart or i don't like a certain texture well, I want it. I love it to see it like perfectly shaped, and people will pay extra for that. Strangely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, yes. But there's a, also like a weird perception of like I think this Japanese fruit thing also goes to like people. 
people think there is something good about a perfectly shaped or perfect looking piece of fruit or vegetable. Mm. And that's quite troubling because when, if you've ever been in a garden or something and you dig out some carrots, they're all, they don't all look the same. They're all kind of gnarly and, and people see that, like we've been kind of brainwashed into thinking that it has to all be the same size and that, and if it's all cleaned up and stuff, that means it's good. That's not like, I think that's a result of like industrialized food and supermarket culture um, uh. that people have forgotten. Like they've forgotten that actually for a food to be na like natural, as natural as possible, it should look a bit gnarly. It can have a few bruises and stuff. And yeah, if you, if you cut off a bruise, on an apple you can still eat the rest of it and even if you ate the bruised part you're not gonna die from it <laughs> like you're not gonna get sick um of course if it has mold then sure don't don't do that but but people are uh, in hong kong i think they get very nervous about like slightly bruised fruit um really? or, yeah they, they'll, they'll if they got to choose if they were at a wet market and they were choosing apples for example or even a supermarket they would like look at the fruit on each side and make sure it's like smooth and um so, and that there are certain things that are a sign of quality i mean say for example if you look at an orange it's it seems heavy for its size then it means it has lots of juice so that is a sign of quality but there are some things that are not a sign of quality for example if the there's a little blemish or some dot like some i don't know some soil on it or um a little dimple because it grew next to um a branch and that's the way it naturally you know formed around the branch that's not a fault but then because people are so removed from food and removed from the growing of food they don't know they can't tell the difference between bad quality and what is a natural disfiguration mm. and that's worrying because it means that in supermarkets especially they create these very strict standards of what of the stock they're getting so yeah. say they go apples we need it this size it needs to be this weight it needs to be this color and what isn't that what doesn't fit that goes into waste or goes to like but they could be perfectly edible yeah. and then we have food waste issues like it goes into the landfill food waste rots when it doesn't have enough oxygen and then it releases methane which is a climate uh, is a is a, a greenhouse gas yeah. so and like that just from that the the industrial that slice of the logistics chain tells you that we have some problems in how we get our food i think it's also you miss out on the creativity side of things for example um back in south africa we had a plum tree fantastic plums we obviously chose the, you know, we, we picked the, the, the nicest uh, mm -hmm. plums out there. But with all the rest, what did we do with it? We made jam. Yeah, exactly. Good God, the jam was... We, we kept them for years, for years. Yeah. A most fantastic jam. Yep. And so, yeah. Yeah. preserving food is yeah. something that also a lot of people have forgotten about. Because yeah. why would you put in all that labor if you could go to the supermarket and pick up some jam? Or if you don't own a plum tree? I mean, we all, uh, what, 80% of the world or something lives in cities now. Yeah. So who has a plum tree? You yeah. know, that's a, that's a yeah. luxury. And that, again, is that removal from the process, from the growing process. You don't even know, like some, I think some kids don't even know what a plum looks like because it's all cut up and peeled by the time it gets to their table. Like, uh, and yeah. yeah, so, and that, that, people think that that's just a funny anecdote, but actually it, it's qu quite a dark kind of, if you think about it deeply, it's it's quite a disturbing fact because <laughs> they don't even know what it looks like. They don't know what to do with it. Like if you gave them a whole plum, like I know for a fact that there are kids in Hong Kong who don't know that they can't eat the the seed, for example, like the stone. They'll probably get to it and be like, what is this? And what do they do with it? And I'm sure people, some kids have not seen a whole fruit in their lives. <laughs> Good grief. Yeah. Well, it also, I suppose it also comes down to, um, and I suppose many of us are guilty of this, it's like meat, you know. Uh, I mean, you, it's, you've got everything nicely and sliced up and yep. covered in plastic and you, you have no idea. You what it, completely forget that yeah. it was a life. Yeah. Um, and, and that 
I'm mean, I'm definitely far far from a vegetarian or a vegan, but I think I kind of made it a mission to know that that was an like to tell myself to remind myself that that was an animal. So for example, we were um, in Australia um, in at my in laws' farm, and over Christmas, um, my husband Gareth had um, shot some rabbits. Because rabbits are pests, seen as pests in Australia, they were a, a species that weren't local, like weren't native. So, mm. so they, yeah, they wreak havoc on the farm. So they shot a few, and I was like, let's cook them. Mm. And I mean, in order to, and then we, I made a rabbit stew for like Christmas dinner or something. But the process is that you've got to kill the thing. You've got to kill an animal. You've got to skin it. You've got to take out the innards that you're not eating. Or I mean, some people do eat the innards. Um, you, yeah, so there's a lot of work. And there's also that reminder that you had to kill it first. I think that's really important because right now, especially in Hong Kong, we eat way too much meat per capita. Actually, we're one of the highest like per meat per capita cities in the world, I think. Because meat is, if you think about it, meat is in every meal. Even if you go to your local diner, Ta San Hang, and they'll give you, you know, pork chop rice. Everything has a bit of meat in it. Mm. If you ask for something vegetarian, it's probably like just some choy sum. And, and then they give you oyster sauce, which is also not, but like, which is made of oysters. Or else the broth is made of like bone yeah, and yeah, stuff like they, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so people, uh, people eat a lot of meat in Hong Kong. And if we go back to like the Amazon rainforest destruction, that has been like the rainforests are destroyed in order to create land for cattle to graze on. Yeah. That means that we eat a lot of beef in order for that to have to happen. Like there's not enough land for the cows. And Hong Kong actually, embarrassingly, I think two years ago, I don't know about the figures now, but in 2018, Brazil, most of the Brazilian beef exports came to Hong Kong. Not anywhere else in the world like but isn't that just anti entry into china well that's what people think but um i think some people looked further into it and it not a lot of it goes to china it's actually it's all in hong kong satisfying the the the, the it's probably hong kong industrial palette. like sort of fast food market wow. um, because brazilian beef is quite cheap um, but that's it's quite cheap also because they didn't have to pay for the rainforest destruction <laughs> so so we eat a lot of meat and it's um, I mean, Hong Kong is a fairly rich city, so in term, you know, in a world like global scale, so that explains why we eat so much of it now. But we don't need it nutritionally. We don't need that much meat. Yeah, you know, people need protein, but you can get protein from all sorts of sources. It doesn't have to be beef. It can actually be smaller animals as well, which are much less taxing on like um, in terms of like carbon footprint. Mm. Um, you don't have to because. Um, cattle are such big animals they actually require a ton of input like soy and things to, for them to eat and mm. then also tons of land water and then they like fart and stuff so there's methane <laughs> and you know we're talking not just like the occasional cow fart we're talking you know tens of thousands of, co of cows <laughs> farting so that's a lot of methane and then there's waste um, so there's a lot of issues with cows um like their poop i know we're talking about farts and poops i'm sorry that's fine that's um, all part of food isn't it? it is part of food exactly <laughs> but people, that's, what, that's what i mean people don't think about this like the cows have to poop and then all the poop goes into a um what do they call them like a basically like a cesspool like mm. it's just a pool it's just sitting there mm. and that waste creates so much greenhouse gases it's insane and it's often not processed properly it's just open pits of dung <laughs> So it's it's horrible actually. As an in, if you raise cows industrially in that way intensively, it's it's super bad for the environment and super bad for land water. It it can end up um, polluting mm. the waterways. Mm. It, it's pretty intense and pretty bad. Um, we can there are more kind of conscious ways of raising animals. Of course, there's something that's become quite interesting like talked about a lot in farming circles now called regenerative farming so usually it means that it farming the farming that actually helps the land to to cure like heal itself and create keep creating value for both the animals How and does the it crops. Work? so it's like a kind of if you think about it kind of like crop rotation right 
So different crops take out different things from, like they need different nutrients from the soil. And also the tap roots are deep uh, and uh, exactly. at different depths. Yes, yeah. exactly. Different depths, um, different um, widths as well. Yeah. So, and sometimes there are crops that give back to the soil as well things that like nutrients that are lost that have been taken out by other crops. So that's why people do crop rotation. So there's like, for example, I think, I mean, I'm not 100% on this, but I'm sure I think buckwheat and wheat or something like that, like get rotated because buckwheat adds things back, whereas wheat extracts. And then you have animals as part of that as well. So for example, cattle can help kick up the soil and keep it aerated because mm. soil dies a lot of there are a lot of microorganisms in soil and those microorganisms are aerobic they need oxygen um, they need the air so that's why deep tap roots are really important because the the roots basically create a way for the air to get in but also animals walking over it also kicks it up and mm -hmm. kind of it, if you think about it like a, a cake batter you're mixing it up a bit and putting air like mixing air whisking air into it so that's what some animals will do and also if you have a well-managed composting system then all the animal um, waste can actually become nutrients for the soil so um, I don't know you you know about composting right so you yeah. often often like basically anything organic from like our hair and nails to bones to of course your weeds and unwanted like apple cores anything can actually break down um, and become nourishing for the soil so in a regenerative farming situation you have a bit of everything basically okay um the pro uh, so they these are actually proven to be quite good for the land and so that land can remain arable and can remain productive and can feed us but that's also not the most um, financially efficient way of running a farm the most financially efficient like industrial on an industrial scale um, you need intensive farming operations with just one product one whether it be excuse me, whether it be um, cattle or poultry or even wheat or soy one big farm is where you can have one person and a giant tractor and you can maintain the entire farm and maybe a lot of pesticides and stuff like sprayed around and that's all you need whereas a regenerative farm you need people to look after all the animals you need to rotate them you need farmers to like physically dig up stuff yeah um it's financially much less efficient and that's why that's why it's not as popular i mean but a lot of back in the day farming used to be that way when when international um importing and exporting was more difficult people needed resilient and and locally sustainable systems and regenerative farming was the norm you had your pigs and cows and even fish and they had sometimes had ponds for aquaculture and then you also have your you know wheat and corn and um, whatever else whatever staples the that community that, that grows well there didn't didn't kaduri farms mm -hmm. have this sort of um, a mentality or this approach they've yeah. become more touristy now haven't they yeah, but so i mean what's what's the story there i'm actually not 100 percent clear on like what it was started as like but i know now it's definitely more of an educational farm yeah. um it is touristy in a sense but you know it's to it's for people to visit and learn about farming it's one way of getting to know how things are grown so mm. like i was saying like markets are one way visiting farms are another way they also do like experimental crops there sometimes so they'll try a particular species, um, say like tomatoes. So there's like a million species of tomatoes. So mm. they'll try some types that they think will be useful for, for Hong Kong farmers. They'll test them out. They'll you know make notes on how they grow, um, what kind of soil it needs, um, what kind of you know shade or light or whatever. And then often with this knowledge, they can help farmers, mm. um, especially if they're starting out or if they're changing crops or something they can offer this help um there's basically a database of how to best grow a certain species or which species works well in hong kong oh i see yeah oh, so I, I think a lot of that a lot of what they do now is kind of like hands-on research i guess yeah 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 well, i think that the history of kaduri farms goes back to i think world war ii well the I, kaduri I... family were kind of yeah definitely like colonial era right hong kong i'm guessing 
I'm totally guessing here, but I'm guessing that they had a farm to feed themselves. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe at least partially, like, yeah, you know, so yeah. that they could have access to some of the pro. I don't know. But definitely now it's more of a sort of educational mm. and um, kind of, they do lead a lot of the thinking in farming now um, in Hong Kong. Another, because they're like a, more of a private or NGO. Did you consult with them or would no no you just you just you just whipped this thing up uh, the the, the Tong Chong market oh, well, without <laughs> I, mean, I mean because Kaduri Farm is not a commercial farm they don't sell oh. for the most part they don't sell their produce. Okay. Um, I think they might I mean they might sell some of it sometimes but they they don't produce enough to go to market. But I actually went found my farmers through the um, agricultural and fisheries department in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. So there is such a department, surprisingly. Um, and actually there are quite a few fish farms in Hong Kong as well. So I saw that there was a organic certification in Hong Kong and that it was actually developed by, a, um, by the Baptist University and a like third party company. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a pretty good system that it, it complies with the international standards so you can really compare it like apples for apples so that was how where i started and i went to the uh, agricultural department and said hey i'm i want to do this and can you help me like connect me to some organic farmers that's how that's how it happened really uh -huh. um, and then once you because the farming community is quite small so once you know one farmer they'll like they'll know like five like basically they know all the farmers they'll introduce <laughs> they you they'll introduce you yeah, all introduce yeah you. they all know each other okay, especially okay. if they're farming organically because back then mm. especially there were maybe back in 2012 i think there are about a hundred certified organic farms or even less they all knew each other and uh, they even like they used to have meetings. I don't know if they still do, um, but they used to have meetings every so often to like, you know, just chat about what's happening and what are you growing? What's working for you? So it's a lot of knowledge exchange in a very organic, <laughs> literally organic way. Um, and they I remember for like Chinese New Year, they had a party and stuff. And you were um, invited. Yeah, I was. Oh. I was. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that was fun. It was like in Yunlong, one of the Chinese restaurants, like old school Chinese restaurants in yeah. Yunlong. And like a Dapai Dong kind of thing. Uh, no, not oh. quite, but still, I mean, still air conditioned, but very local place. And, right. um, you know, usually at these annual events, you have lucky draws. So their lucky draw prizes were like baskets of produce. It was really cute. <laughs> really cute. Yeah. <laughs> So where to go? Where to go for 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 this interesting food? Like, um, like what sort of restaurants? What, what are the restaurants that actually purchase from this uh, Tong Chong market? Um, it'd be great to so to support that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some restaurants actually, a lot of restaurants now uh, order directly from the farmers because mm. the good thing about the market is that you can get the contact of a farmer. Like they have, you know, business cards and stuff, and you can make that connection right away. So initially, yes, there were chefs who would come and check out the market and see what was available. And they were sort of testing the waters back then, you know, trying a bit of this, a bit of that. So it made sense to come to the market to mm. buy. But because restaurants usually volume wise, they need a bit more. Mm. Um, then the market became a place where they would come and get to know a farmer, maybe try some of, like sample some of the stuff and yeah. then get their contact and order from them. So like a few restaurants in Hong Kong, like actually more and more restaurants in Hong Kong are using local produce, um, which is very encouraging for me because it just means that finally people are starting to understand yeah. that we do have a local kind of culture of farming and people mm. are appreciating the quality. So for example, there's a good one called Roganic, um, which is actually a um, outpost from a British restaurant. And it's really interesting because usually what happens when a famous chef opens in Hong Kong is that they just kind of bring a cookie cutter uh, concept here and they import everything from wherever they're from. So if they're from France, they import everything from France so that they can keep the same, like they have the same menu, even same consistency. Like consistency is important for a restaurant. But with Roganic, they, in the UK, they are in the Lake District, so quite a sort of rural area. Um, apparently beautiful, but I've never been there. And they're, they're known for using a lot of the uh, local, like produce mm -hmm. from local farms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Hong Kong, they have brought that model here. So they're not importing 
things so much from the UK. Um, they're trying to create new relationships with farmers here. So doing the same, the same idea, but completely different produce. Mm. Um, some of the menu items are the same, but actually a lot of them are for Hong Kong and they're, they're specific to here. So anything from salads to proteins like chicken and um, I think they have this great dish, which they sometimes, they because they, they change their menu quite often, but one particular dish that comes back every so often is a like charred salad. So they basically put vegetables, all sorts of vegetables on a grill and char them. So they're almost burned on the sides, but it has this like incredible God, rich good. flavor. Yeah. And then they toss it up in. Um, so it's, it's still crunchy because it's just charred, yeah. not like steamed. Yeah. Um, it's still crunchy and it has like a great dressing. And that's like one of their signature dishes that I really love. Um, and then they also use like really good local chicken. A lot of chefs now are using local chicken um, because the chicken here is known to be quite flavorful, has like great, I know it sounds weird, but it has great fat. Like the fat is flavor, basically. If you have really mm. good fat, it means it'll bring the meat a lot more flavor. Yeah. So that's um, a lot of chefs here now are making like amazing roast chickens, <laughs> for example, out of um, local chicken. Yeah. Um, there's another restaurant in Wan Chai called Roots. Um, they are a very small restaurant. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they use a lot of like local farm produce as well. Um, yeah, there's quite a few now. Yeah, I recall a, a very interesting eating ex experience I had. Um, we went to Vietnam and the restaurant, basically, y y they, they completely blotted out all the light, all the light. So you sat down for a three course uh, meal okay. in the complete dark. And I, I remember that experience. It was really good fun because, you, I, of course, I'm... Eating, like, I'm going to eat like an animal, right? Like nobody can see yeah. me. Then it's actually fine dining, and, and there's Stuart in the dark eating, like you know, like, <laughs> with, with, <laughs> there's, there's no knife and fork exactly. <laughs> yeah. But but I, I thought that experience was really, really quite interesting. Is there anything like that here in Hong Kong? Have you heard of that? There is actually. Um, I don't know if it's still running right now, but there was an NGO-run restaurant called Dining in the Dark, and it, mm. they actually created it because it was by an NGO that. Um, supports people with disabilities. So it was an experience. It's the same one. Yeah. That's the one. Okay, yeah. Okay. So it's an experience to so that people can see can you feel for a meal's length um, what yeah. it's like to not be able to see anything. Oh. And I've never been myself, um, but yeah, it it did exist. I think it's still probably around, but I don't know if they're operating. Yeah, there's something like that in Hong Kong. Oh, but right. it's funny cuz like eating is a very sensory experience oh. and you know, even the and cooking is as well, like looking at the color of a vegetable tells you whether it's done or not, whether it's translucent or opaque. You know, these, the, there's, there are changes that happen to meat or fish or anything, a, a vegetable even. Um, and there's also sounds that it makes as it's, for example, pan frying. You can hear the sound yeah. and things like, um, you know, even boiling water. You know water is boiling because you can hear it bubbling away. Like, boop, 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 boop. And that is like all part of the eating and cooking experience. If you and I do think it is valuable to find out what it's like when you can't like you've lost one of those mm. um, Sensory, uh, abilities. Yeah. 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 And if you look at, especially in fine dining, the the visual aspect of a meal is very important. Plating is an art in itself, using different colors, using, and then eating it, like different textures mm. beyond just flavor. I think in, um, actually texture is an interesting thing because I don't know, are there any foods you don't like to eat? Like, uh, especially like things like sea cucumber, or let me think. Well, I'm vegetarian. Oh, so. you're vegetarian. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, so you're definitely not eating it. How about okra? Do you eat okra? Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually really enjoy okra. Yeah. So okra yeah. is actually one thing that I think even some vegetarians don't like. Oh, yeah. Um, or uh, some people in general there, don't There is like. a fruit that it's that star fruit. Mm -hmm. You don't like there's some. Uh, there's something about that. But just, you know, I can eat it if it's for survival purposes. <laughs> Yeah. You know, but and you, actually, you don't and, prefer it. Yeah. Yeah. And also aubergine. My wife loves aubergine. 
and you know it's one of my it's you know it's star fruit category to me for me yeah. and then and i noticed on the on the on the on the on the meals every night would be like more and more aubergine aubergine <laughs> I'm like darling you know please please and something <laughs> else please enough, enough of the aubergine so yeah but why do you why do you ask uh, because, this question uh, so actually I, now i'm curious like what about aubergine or star fruit like is unpleasant oh. to you okay well with the star fruit it's I don't, it's, is it the it's tartness more the, or the yeah tannic, the tartness. Sort of yeah, yeah, tannic yeah, yeah, tartness? Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's it. Yeah, so like that, that is actually well, that's a flavor thing. Yeah. How about aubergine? Also, it also has a bit of that almost spiciness, right. like that yeah. sort of yeah. tingling feeling sometimes. Yeah. So that that's actually quite um, quite common. Also grapes. Yeah, the grapes also have that tannin yeah, tannic that, thing that, as well. Like yeah. it affects me so much more than normal people. Do you? It's, yeah. So you, I'm guessing you don't like wine. Uh, Some wine, it's, so, it's, like yeah, what, wine, wine. If it's needed, I I, I will do it I, I, again. You know, so it's not your uh, preference. Yeah. No, right? it's not my like, preference. T- and tea, like strong tea as well. Uh, no, yeah, yeah I don't, so I don't like that. I think yeah. if I were to like diagnose you, um, <laughs> I think what you're sensitive to is this thing called tannins. Oh, right. So tannins are a sort of astringent taste, and usually it it's things that have um, this is. On a nutritional standpoint, it usually has a lot of antioxidants, so it's quite yeah, good for you. Okay. <laughs> actually, but, uh, actually, t- tannin tannin is a self defense mechanism in plants yes, and trees. To, so yeah. Soon, yeah, so as soon as like you know like uh, infestation or like insects start eating it, what happens is the plant kind of stings yeah. them with it. Yeah. So that's what it's doing to your taste buds. It's kind of stinging mm. you. Um, and wine is the same because wine is made from grapes, and grapes have a ton of tannins, mm. especially mm-hmm. the seeds. Um, and the the stalks. So so yeah, I think the tannins. That's a that's a pretty. T- I mean, a lot of people don't like it. Yeah, yeah but you're yeah. probably specifically like sensitive yeah, to that. Yeah. But I was thinking more about texture because I think, for example, okra. It's mm. slightly slimy inside. Yeah. You know, if you eat it, like if you cr- like yeah. break it in half, you'll I see love the that. slime. That's great. You love it. Okay, yeah. that's great. Because a lot of people don't. They find it. Yeah. You know that sort of mucusy slime. Yeah, um, yeah. They're like always kind of like your, you know, <laughs> what you blow out of your nose or something. Or, <laughs> and people find it kind of gross. Hey, when I was a kid, I used to eat that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I know some. I knew a kid like you from school. <laughs> I mean, very young. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. Whatever. Yeah, you still do it now. I'm sure. That's why you love okra. <laughs> no, 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 I like okra too. But it is a distinctive um, texture, mm. and it's nothing to do with the flavor. It's that feel in your mouth yeah. and I think like some things um, kind of like well sea cucumber I think is a pretty typical one because it's kind of bouncy and um, the way Chinese people cook it anyway or like um, um, well because you're vegetarian you wouldn't know but like um, like slow cooked meat on the bone usually has some connective tissue like very collagen rich connective tissue and that breaks down that as can you, be a bit jelly yes planted. like a yeah. jelly sticky right. jelly yeah. and that's a similar texture to sea cucumber and some mm. people just can't deal with it um so. so i think a lot of times when people especially i think western people um writing about chinese food get very confused with texture because that kind of those kinds of textures don't really exist as much in European foods as they do in Asian foods, um, and I think that some sometimes people confuse it with flavor. But actually, this is not flavor. This is a this is a texture that you just feel like it has no. Just because it's sort of sticky doesn't mean it tastes more sour or sweet or mm. whatever, right? So um, I find that in Chinese food a diversity of textures is just as important as a balance of flavors. So if you look at, say, really typical dish that everyone knows, like sweet and sour, like pork or sweet and sour, like mushrooms or something. So it's something um, that's a piece of meat or a cube of pork or something. It's coated in a batter. It's deep fried first. So when you deep fry it, you get that crunchy outside Mm. but because it's so in batter usually there is like some kind of starch and a an egg so it creates a protective barrier around the meat or whatever's inside could be mushroom um, or something like that and that locks in the moisture so that's what keeps it juicy but then you have this um, crunchiness on the outside and then you put a sauce over it 
that is sort of um, syrupy and clings yeah. to the batter. And then you serve that with, say, like a like chopped up pineapple or um, or peppers that are quite crunchy. So you're eating it. You eat it together, and you get the crunchiness of the fruit or the vegetable, like uh, peppers, pineapple. You get some juice from that, and then you bite into the meat part, and you get the stickiness first, and then you get the crunchiness, and then inside you get juice and tenderness from mm. the meat, or if a vegetarian alternative would, I would say is a mushroom probably. Yeah. And you get a juiciness and you get kind of a burst of, it's like a little burst of excitement in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and that is really important, I think, in Chinese food. I, I, it's important in other cuisines as well, but I think in Chinese food, it's very, it's very um, uh, heavily kind of, there's a lot of weight put onto that. Um, if in, for example, if you order a full meal of a Cantonese dinner, and usually, you know, Cantonese dinners you share, everyone yeah. has a bowl of rice, and you each dip into the, some of the dishes, usually you'll have different cooking methods mm. because you need that diversity of texture. So you might have some steamed egg, which is almost like a custard. Um, it's like tofu when you like put your spoon in it and it comes out kind of like a pudding. It's super smooth. And then you have like, say, pan fried like stir fry something, vegetables, and which gives you a bit of char, you get a little bit of oil on it, you have your maybe just some soy sauce. And then you might um, have like, um, or like a, I don't know, cha siu, so roast pork um, from the, you can get it from like the roast meat shops. And that is tender inside, but it's roasted, it's charred on the outside, it has some crunchiness, and it has some sweetness as well. Mm. So it's like a mix, a whole, symphony of flavors textures to go with your rice like it's that's just the way we eat and if everything was the same sort of textures like it's like steamed steamed egg and then you have some steamed fish and then you have some steamed aubergines it's all kind of the same tone like you yeah. don't get the crust crunchiness and stuff like that and that would be considered a pretty boring meal to most mm. like i think cantonese people or they'd say like oh you're trying to be super healthy <laughs> right yeah now, one famous dish out here in Hong Kong is those is that duck. You know, they, they've got like like ducks Rose hanging. Goose. goose. That's the oh goose. That's the one. It's usually the, the good version. So you look. You looked at you. The way you looked at me was like, oh yeah. No yeah, no no. Yeah. no. <laughs> yes. I don't blame you because you're a vegetarian. Um, but no, yes, duck. It sometimes is duck, but the sort of prestigious version is always goose. So if goose, goose is more expensive okay and also it has a deeper flavor but how does how does how does, how, how does that how's what's the preparation process how does that stuff work um so it gets marinated it's pretty simple it's it's a roast basically so they okay. um you know just then why do they hang it out on the uh, yeah. yeah um those are like really typical kind of barbecue cantonese barbecue shops and oh. Hanging everything, hanging all the meats up there, like tasio, what I mentioned before, is one of them. Mm. Um, you have your like crispy roast pork. Mm. Um, you have your goose. Hanging it out there is almost like advertising. Ah, so when right. people walk past, they'd be like, "Ooh, that looks yummy!" Like I want to take some of that home. Okay, that's the main thing. Okay, okay. Um, so before back in the day in Hong Kong, before there were so many restaurants and stuff, a lot of food was sold just on the street by mm. um, hawkers or, you know, they call them like street vendors, basically. So they would have a push cart and they just stand on the street. So you want to attract people to come and buy from you. So you display your wares. Mm. And you look at something like a roast goose, it's, it's been roasted till the skin is really crispy. It's like got this caramel color. It's glossy because they put some oil, like, uh, brush some oil on it mm. that looks very enticing to a lot of people and um, and that's seen as a treat actually it, to buy to be able to afford back in the day to afford a large amount of meat like that and that's something that you can't make usually at home either because normally Chinese home kitchens don't have ovens Right. So it's not something, and especially in Hong Kong, because our apartments are so small, yeah. you definitely don't have space for an oven. Um, and also their ovens are special. Um, Chinese ovens are kind of, they kind of look like tandoors. They're, they're like a big barrel. Um, okay. And then you submerge the meat, you put the meat on, like you hang it on oh, something and you I've submerge it. That. Yeah. yeah. And the, there's a heat source at the bottom. It used to be like wood or, or um, 
coal, coal or charcoal, not coal, <laughs> charcoal. Um, nowadays, it's most likely gas. So you have the, the fire at the bottom and it heats up the entire tandoor um, or the, the oven and you just put your meat in there and it gets roasted really evenly all around. So that's your typical like Cantonese roast meat oven. Um, and yeah, that's why they, they hang it out because when it's freshly roasted, it smells amazing and it looks amazing. Mm. Um, the colors, you know, that enticing brownish red. Um, and then I think when they moved into shop fronts, they just sort of thought we'd do the same thing. Like, why hide it? These are their prime wares, you know? <laughs> it's like if you have a great pair of shoes, you're going to put them in the front window. You're yeah, not going to yeah, put right, them and right. keep them in a box out back. <laughs> and you want to tell people it's fresh as well because yeah. people can tell whether, um, you know, if a roast goose, um, if the skin has gone all sort of, um, opaque or, or not glossy, then it, maybe it's been sitting around for a while. So it's a sign of freshness yeah. as well. Okay. So what are the, what, what are the sort of signature dishes of Hong Kong? Um, maybe, you sort of, maybe you can go into that. Yeah. Uh, you know. um, okay. So I think food is really interesting because you can always relate it to like the history of a place as well. Right. And Hong Kong, it was... Basically, before, I don't know if this is controversial to say, but before the British came and made it a trading port, like as an effect of the Opium War, Hong Kong was actually not like a city, like a well known city. It was a series of fishing villages. It was a fishing village? Yeah, That's fishing it. villages. Yeah. 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 It wasn't a city in itself. Like during, so before the Brits came to Hong Kong, they were in like Guangzhou. That used mm. to be their main port. And then they were, you know, uh, there was the Opium War and they got kicked out because they were trying to sell opium and get everyone addicted. Bloody Brits. Um, so they got, came to Hong Kong. They oh, chose come on, it. That's a very sensible business model. I mean, I, right? Like a typical like colonial <laughs> business model, I guess. And they could back in the day. They had the big. They had guns, and yeah. you know the Qing Dynasty had some spears. <laughs> um, so so yeah, they came to Hong Kong because the port, like the the harbor, is really deep, so it's really good for their shipping boats. Okay, so. So before the Brits came, basically, you could pretty much expect people to probably be eating like fish and things like just really, you know, stuff mostly from the sea, I would say, because we are an island, mm. a series of islands. So when the Brits came and trading started to happen, a lot of things started coming in from abroad. So if you look, if we kind of jump to the 40s and 50s after World War Two, there was a lot of canned food canning preserving became like industrial preserving not like the plum jam you make at home but, mm. but canning became a big thing and canned food started being shipped into hong kong so from there where i'm getting to is milk tea so oh, jesus oh. <laughs> you love it i love it this is one of the things that i'm not sure i could you know if i were to leave hong kong that is one of the it? things i'm gonna miss the most yeah so milk tea Obviously, milk is not a, was not a huge part of the Chinese diet. Yeah. Um, although, it's it wasn't completely absent. Um, there is a part of China that has buffalo milk. So let's, but we can talk about that later, or or people can look it up. <laughs> but uh, cow's milk was not a big part of Cantonese or Southern Chinese eating, just right. because we didn't have much cattle. So. Um, Con uh, not condensed milk, um, evaporated milk in cans started arriving from yeah. because we're a trading port. Yeah. And then also... Coronation, right? Yes, the coronation. Cor 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 yeah. Carnation. That's carnation, the, the, the flower. Carnation. Yeah. Carnation, not coronation. Yeah, not coronation. <laughs> that would be much more... I mean, yeah, the queen's tea. Kind of. uh, <laughs> right, yeah. But uh, carnation, yes. Carnation yeah. was one of the you know iconic brands. And then you have um, Ceylon tea, which Ceylon is sh the old name for Sri Lanka. Yes. So tea, yes. even though tea was probably um, native to China the it was actually it was brought over to um sri lanka and uh have the, you been to sri lanka yes i have yeah. fantastic hey those tea things are uh, amazing yeah, exactly. did you go on the train ride up the up, i uh, did i did yes yeah, yeah. along it was beautiful and you, yeah. so much tea yeah. do you know one of one of um miyazaki's um films was inspired by that oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah it is but, truly. but but you know just the journey you know you started off down the lowlands and then you could see the mm -hmm. the environment and, and as you, you start going up, up it's like the whole scenery changes yeah. and i remember hanging out of the train and yeah it's quite magical <laughs> like it, that it really it's a fantastic yeah. fantastic place and yeah. then and then and then buying 
you can go there and you can get like a really really good tea yep but like just the tips yes, you yes pick them exactly off yeah and and you pay a fortune for mm-hmm. it but <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's yeah so okay so that's the Ceylon so, so that's yeah. the origins of the yeah. so-called Ceylon tea so that yeah. that started coming into Hong Kong through shipping as well right. thanks to the Brits so uh, Hong Kong has basically made a version of British how the British drink tea you know with milk tea right. with milk black tea and milk but we made it like super strong because yeah. I think that's how that's how people like like that's how bold the flavors like that people liked bold flavors they wanted the tannins actually yeah. surprise I'm surprised you like milk tea because there's a lot of tannins yeah. in milk tea yeah. um, but it's kind of smoothed out or balanced out by the slightly thicker milk right so uh, milk tea to me is one of the most Hong Kong things you can have because it wouldn't have come into existence if not for Hong Kong being this trading port and yeah. having this influence. Um, and there's the whole culture of the Cha Tan Tang or the diners, cafes, local cafes and diners where you eat completely imported stuff, like things that are not native to Cantonese um, diets like macaroni. Um, macaroni oh, that's like true. pasta right yeah. pasta made out of wheat is not something that we eat in southern china usually like traditionally because we didn't grow much wheat wheat mm. is a northern china thing and also pasta dried pasta lasts forever so that became really popular as an import as well but you have macaroni in hong kong in one of these ta tan hang and it's not cooked like a pasta it's put in soup yeah right and, yeah but if you think about it, that's how we eat noodles, soup noodles, yeah, if you yeah. go to a more kind of traditional Chinese shop. So I think that's your kind of collision of cultures as well. Like these sort of noodle-like things arrived. We're like, okay, what do we do with it? It's kind of <laughs> like, we cook it like a noodle, so let's eat it like a noodle, even though the shape is completely different. Right. Um, so then that's, where, that's why you have like um, macaroni in this sort of light broth with some um, yeah. ham on top or something, yeah, or an egg. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, again, that's because of this stuff just coming in and people going, well, how do we localize? No, they don't go, how do we localize it? It's like, how do we want to eat it? Mm. And then this dish gets created. Mm. Um, yeah, like that, that whole series of stuff that you get at Ta Tan Tang's, um, those diners, to me, are the most Hong Kong thing. Because yeah. people come to Hong Kong and they, they eat dim sum, for example. And dim sum, yeah, it's a part of Hong Kong. It's a big part of how we eat. Um, you know, families gather for Sunday brunch over dim sum. But dim sum is from the Cantonese culture in Guangdo- Guangzhou that kind of precedes Hong Kong as okay. a, in terms of history. Yeah. It, it was brought here. Yeah. Um, but what was truly made here is this kind of newer, weird, you could call it fusion, I guess, stuff that was the result of a collision of cultures of like fusion of cultures you mean it it, it affected the um the dim sum no i'm okay. talking about like the like the macaroni okay and the, the macaroni milk tea. and like, like the, the milk tea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah dim sum actually has not changed that much um okay. in, you know we still have your you know ka gao the prawn dumplings or the you know tiu zhao fan guo or like you know like all sorts of dumplings basically and like baos and things like that that all comes from a much older Cantonese traditions so it wasn't the result of just Hong Kong like it wasn't Hong Kong that kind of created these things right right right, right. yeah but uh, obviously yeah dim sum is and Cantonese culture is a big part of Hong Kong because most people in Hong Kong are from the that Canton sort of area, area. Yeah. yeah we also have like a big Shanghainese community and like a Fujian community but most people I'd say the because just because of proximity we're closest to Guangzhou so um naturally most people coming here were from Guangzhou and that's why Cantonese is our kind of native spoken language mm. um, and yeah so that reflects in the food as well so things like wontons came from Guangzhou like wonton noodles that's an interesting story apparently wontons so you know the dumplings with usually with like some prawn inside and a yeah. really thin wrapper and it's sort of like cloudy yeah, it's yeah. Like, uh, and it yeah. kind of floats yes. in a very kind of yes. elegant way like a handkerchief yeah. in some yeah and then with really thin noodles apparently legend has it that um because again southern china doesn't grow much wheat so it's like how did wontons come about because they're wheat based wrappers and wheat based noodles um, apparently what happened was someone, a chef um, who, from Guangzhou, visited northern China 
where they eat tons of dumplings um, and in like huge amounts as well. Like you go to a shop, it's like, oh, I'll have five dozen dumplings, thanks. Like that's a normal order. Um, and he saw that and he thought that's, I like, you know, dumplings are great. Like dumplings in soup are a great meal or snack even. But in Southern China, people don't like really thick wrappers. They want things to be super delicate and smooth. So that's the texture thing coming mm. back. So he's like, okay, now I'm going to create, instead of the thick wrappers in Northern China, I'm going to create thin wrappers, like really as thin as possible. So thin that you could see the filling inside the dumpling. And then he also chose prawns because Southern China also has a lot of um, fresh water, like rivers and lakes and even the ocean um, in some parts. And you can get a lot of prawns. And also prawns were like good prawns were seen as a kind of a everyday luxury, I guess. Mm. Like you don't need it. You don't need it like every day, but it's like a it's a nice thing to have. So what he did was created these dumplings with some prawn and really thin wrappers. And he apparently stood outside movie theaters. So people after the movie would be maybe, let's say 10 p.m. So it's after dinner time, but it's before bedtime. And you can sell them a bowl, a small bowl of wonton noodles as a snack on their way home. So that Uh. apparently is the legend of how wonton noodles were created. And then this culture, um, and also one of the sort of original famous makers of wontons ended up coming to Hong Kong when Hong Kong was starting to, you know, boom and created shops here or like it created a hawker stand, a street store stand, which eventually moved into a shop. And that that actually is a story um, of a really famous place called Max in on Wellington Street, um, M-A-K um, is that that's their surname. And yeah, that's that's how apparently that's how it came to Hong Kong. And now it's become like a really iconic thing that people eat here, that people will like seek it out to to eat. And obviously there's not much tourism these days, but when there was, there would constantly be a stream of people going in, um, either having seen it in a guidebook or, you know, watched, saw it on TV because they've been on TV like multiple times as well. So that's that's something I would associate with Hong Kong as well. Like the, yeah. the immigration from China and what they brought with them yeah. is quite specific. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. For, for me, for, for, for me, uh, Hong Kong is just such a special place when it comes to food is it, because it's a cultural me- melting pot of Asia. You can get everything. You can get everything here. Yeah. Well, you pay. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And and there's some things like cheese, for example. Mm. Cheese is travesty, man. The prices of cheese. Yeah. The price of cheese out here is so high. Yeah. Do you have any, like, what's the cheese? You think you think uh, these farmers can start making cheese out here? Well, first well, you need milk. Yeah, you need well. milk for cheese. But they, but they got that. They got the, there's a there's a, a dairy. There's no dairy in Hong Kong. Really? Not anymore. What about there, that? There used to be one. What about that that brand? Uh, Trappist. Yeah. Yeah, they're not. Then, from to my knowledge, they're no longer in Hong Kong. They're just oh, across the border. That's a pity. They used to be. Yeah, I think okay. Trappist or not Calendary, probably Trappist used to have a farm here. I think, mm. but they stopped uh, quite a while ago. And uh, yeah, so we can't. I mean, you can still make cheese out of powdered milk, but it's not going to yeah. be very nice. Yeah. Um, and you can also actually now we can talk about buffalo milk actually because yeah. in um, there's a place called Da Liang in Guangdong Province. Yeah. It's a it's near. Damn, my geography is off. I think it's near Zhongshan ish. Yeah. Or Foshan. Oh, Foshan. It's near Foshan, and they are known for buffalo milk. It's a very weird, I don't know the history, but it's a weird sort of little area where they farm buffaloes. And so they have buffalo milk and they make milk puddings and also this funny product where they dry the milk with some salt Mm. and it turns into these dried milk discs. And these discs can be um, reconstituted or like flaked into a bowl of congee, like rice porridge. Mm. And it really brings out the flavor. If you use good rice in your rice porridge, it makes it really flavorful. So it's like a specialty of that area. Mm. So there, so I'm guessing that in this particular area of Guangdong province, 
they're not lactose intolerant (laughs) (laughs) because they have traditionally had buffalo milk. But actually most of Guangdong doesn't. Uh, It's very specific to that area. Right. Um, But yeah, we don't have really milking quality buffaloes in Hong Kong. I don't think so. They might have buffaloes that help them farm, but I doubt it actually. Labor. Okay. Yeah, so, labor. So, yeah, but I yeah. really doubt it. I don't think we even have that in Hong Kong anymore. Um, right. But yeah, cheese, these days, um, there are a ton of French expats in Hong Kong. I don't know if you've noticed. But yeah. Yeah. There's more and more French And there's expats. these like, little underground groups where, you know, I'm going over to France or Holland. Probably uh, like and a suitcase bring, full yeah, of, yeah. Wheels of it. Smuggling Wheels some of it. It's, it's fantastic. It's yeah. Fantastic. So, like, obviously, if you know a French person, that's great. Yeah. Um, but there are also um, actual shops now that sell, like, imported French cheeses. Yeah, yeah. And they sell more that are slightly better priced than if you go to, like, a big international supermarket or something. Yeah. And the quality is quite good. Yeah, Shen Shen Wan has got one of those places. Um, Monsieur get... Chate, I think there's one. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Monsieur Chate, and then in the mid levels and Wan Chai, there's one called La Cremerie, like the okay. Creamery. Yeah. Um, I think they also sell or sold wine. At, like they have other shops that sell wine, so they're oh. very French. Like their whole business model is super French, uh, and they have more interesting cheeses. Um, so French cheese, I think we're kind of getting better now in Hong Kong. Yep. And in terms of price as well, they have a range of stuff. It's not just the expensive okay. stuff. Okay. And they have some more kind of your fresh cheeses that are more reasonably priced. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, making cheese in Hong Kong is going to be quite difficult. Mm. Although, have you tried vegan cheese made out of cashews and things like um, that? Yeah, I have. And I, and I don't think much of it. Of it. But, so yeah. in... There's some like, you know, vegetarian shops like Green Common and stuff. Yeah, they, yeah. They import it, which, you know, it's to me, that's sort of an industrial product. It's not always, it's not, it's hard to compare that with artisanal French cheese. Yeah. But then there are also people or restaurants that um, have made like cashew cheeses themselves and, cu- and actually cultured them, not just like put some cultures, kind of like yogurt culture into oh, yeah. them to create that sort of tangy flavor that's also okay. in dairy cheese. And so they, it's closed now, sadly, but there was a restaurant called Grassroots Pantry, um, which then actually, the, this is really embarrassing, the name escapes me now, but they actually transitioned into a fine dining restaurant and they had a cheese board, but it was fully vegan. And the cheeses were legit, like they were all made out of nuts, like cashews, macadamias, things like that. And um, they would age them as well, just as you would dairy cheeses and aged at a certain temperature, like left to, so that the cultures would um, kind of spread in the mixture. Mm. And there would be hard cheeses, soft cheeses. It's actually really amazing. So there are, you know, I think in Hong Kong, if we really wanted to explore making cheese, I think vegan cheeses are a good place to start. I know it sounds niche, but it's something that we can actually do because nuts, we can definitely import really easily and they're Mm. much easier in terms of storage than fresh milk, for example. Yeah, that's the, you, you, you raise up a, a, an interesting set of questions now. So from your perspective, which is a very informed one with regard to food, what sort of areas do you think would be very successful? Like, for example, this, this, uh, this vegan cheese. Are there any other sort of areas you would like think about and think, you know, actually that could work really well? Um, yeah. In Hong Kong specifically? Yeah, Hong Kong specifically. Well, I say vegan cheese because, um, because of in terms of production and trying to source the right, right base materials. Not, I mean, I'm not as confident about the consumers, like that there are enough consumers that want to mm. consume it because cheese is still quite a foreign concept to a lot mm. of people. And then when you say vegan cheese, that's another like that's another, another step away leap. from the norm. Yeah. 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 Um, what else? I mean, Hong Kong so far. I don't know if you've noticed, but it has. Um, really been really a good environment for um, craft beer. Oh, the Have you IPAs? Tried some no, Hong Kong? no, no I, not I, always IPAs. Uh, okay, not okay, always IPAs. okay. I don't like IPAs either. Yeah, and uh, they're super bitter. So uh, yeah, and I'm not. You see, a huge it's going back down to that 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 taste. That tanning, yeah, 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 that yeah, sort yeah. of tannins and yeah, the yeah. astringency of yeah. Um, but beer, it's interesting because it's also from a 
sort of operational standpoint, it works really easily in Hong Kong because even though beer is alcohol, you don't need a specific like alcohol brewing license in order to brew beer. You just need a food license, like a food factory license. Oh, right. It's really interesting. Licensing in Hong Kong is a minefield, but also you can find loopholes like that sometimes. So, um, yeah, so beer brewing has become quite big here. Um, and there are some really funky, interesting beers coming out. I don't know if you've ever tried like sour beers. Mm. To me, because I'm not a huge beer drinker. I'm not into that sort of hoppy, bitter sort of flavor. Mm. And lagers for me are like, I don't know, I, I don't love them. And the, the, the bubbles, the carbon dioxide actually screws up my digestive system. <laughs> So I don't. I'm not a huge. Strong? Yeah, I'm not okay. a huge fan of beer. Um, don't but don't, you, don't you have some sort of like qualification about drinking not, or not something? Not in beer, um, but uh, I I do. I did study wine for a while, so I have okay. like a certificate in wine. But it's it was just for fun. Right? Okay. And okay. I love wine. I drink a lot of wine. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I love buying wine, and I love like um, just to di- you know, go on a tangent a little bit. Wine is also reflective of a place because yeah. you have your grapes you have not only grapes from like the soil the temperatures and everything right. and the type of grape but also you need um it's also a fermented product so you need yeast so if you use natural yeast captured in that environment that is a distinctive strain that is going to affect the flavor of your end yeah. product so for me that's like a bottle wine is like bottled history and bottled travel it's really interesting to me like and i love that i just love dissecting the flavors and i'm not a huge like i'm not in those there's some really snobby like well no, okay i shouldn't say that but there's very some very knowledgeable <laughs> and sometimes snobby wine people yeah. who are like mm, you know swelling wine go mm, i smell violets and whatever i mean th- that's helpful to an extent because you do want to be able to put a label to certain things description is important but that's to me that's not the be all and end all of tasting wine like i want to be transported somewhere i want to i want to taste what the winemaker how the winemaker thinks his or her wine should be um and i you know if the wine tastes a bit funky because they used a natural yeast that went a little awry so be it like that's if that's what they intended of Mm. course if it was a fault and they're like oh my god we shouldn't have done that Mm. then okay fine that's that is a fault but if that's their intention then i'm like i want to taste that intention that to me is is why i love more kind of um i i hesitate to say artisanal but basically that's what it is like artisanal rather than industrial because there is industrial wine where they just try and pump out the same flavors every time. So the yeah. descriptions I was talking about, like violets and cherries and stuff, there's certain at a certain price point, um, what they do is they manipulate the wine in a lot of ways, like add sugar or use a um, industrial yeast that is you know specific and you can buy it um, to create the exact same flavors over and over again. And that's that's boring to me. That's like going to a fast food restaurant. Like, right. I mean, sometimes I don't yeah. mind it, but it's like, I don't want it every day. That's not interesting to me at all. And it's, especially when it's alcohol and alcohol is supposed to be bad for you. Like, I don't want to waste my, <laughs> my quota. Yeah, my, yeah. Like, I don't want to harm, if I was going to harm my health, like, if it's going to be detrimental to my health, at least I should derive pr- pleasure from it. Yes, That's, yes. Yeah. So anyway, that was wine. Are you one of those super tasters? You know, those um, people that can like really... Yeah, so I did a DNA test. You oh, know, yeah? just a simple like 23 and Me or something. Yes, yes. Sorry, can we turn the air con back oh, on? Oh, yeah, is it getting a bit hot? It's yeah. getting quite warm. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah, um, I'm just going to turn up the temperature a little Yeah, bit. so that it's not super cold as well. There we go. Yeah, so... 25 yeah, I did is a, good? I did, yeah, 25 is mm. fine. Um, I did a DNA test. Um, it was super simple, like saliva test. Mm. And they will tell you certain, you know, what you have, like certain certain things that are noteworthy mm. and yes they did say i was a super taster and i think ah, okay. that just means that you have like a lot more taste buds on your on your tongue not because that is not the be all and end all because in order to you need to be able to articulate those flavors you can taste them but then you might not know what to say about them or what to think or what to remember about them right So a lot of flavor is memory. You don't have to be a super taster to remember that you don't like star fruit because of that astringency. 
You know, that's just something that you, it's a mind taste bud kind of connection that you make. And everyone does that. And that's also, that's actually why a lot of people love the food of their childhood, because that's what they used to, what they grew up on. Yeah. Yeah. And that has kind of makes an imprint into your mind of like what is good or if you associate it with happy memories you know some people love Mm. the flavor of like birthday cakes because you know they always had amazing birthdays or something or they love um you know apple pies from mcdonald's because that was a treat for them you know when they did well on a test their mom brought them to mcdonald's for an apple pie for example i see Mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter that that apple pie was like deep fried in fat that's been around for like a week (laughs) or it's made out of like you know dodgy like oils it's not about that it's sometimes it's associated with a certain memory right. so it doesn't the, the the taste bud thing is one factor but it's definitely not the be all and end all of tasting stuff right. yeah um but actually i went on to wine because i was talking about beer oh yeah um beer in hong kong has just like boomed amazingly usually just because of the ease of licensing whereas if you try and distill liquor up to I think anything over 30% alcohol becomes uh, sort of an explosive in the eyes of uh, the government Mm. so that it becomes much more difficult that's why we don't have like in other countries in the world there's now all these craft gin or craft like new kind of um, hipster whiskey places or something just popping up in cities in Hong Kong, we don't really have that. You're referring to specifically Japan? No, uh, no. Oh, okay. um, uh, even in like the UK, um, there's like a ton oh, of right. new gin distilleries that are yeah. just sort of in the city. Um, and the and gin is something that is actually quite cheap to make because you just need a neutral base alcohol and then you put in your flavors and it doesn't. you don't have to age it. Whiskey usually needs to be aged um, because if you don't age whiskey in barrels you don't get that color you don't get that flavor the caramel sort of flavor um so gin doesn't require that so a lot of um new companies new liquor companies uh, have been selling gin and i think that's that's become quite a trend in the past sort of five ten years in the food and beverage world but you don't see that in hong kong because of that explosive thing um and so you see a lot of beer and there's a company called young master ales that have like done these super experimental beers um i said i don't like lagers and ipas and stuff but they do this thing called a sour beer and i think it's like they've i think it's a certain i'm not exactly sure but i think it's a certain type of fermentation that leads to a sour flavor and to me that's like so refreshing especially in summer in um when it's hot outside and you crack a nice cold sour beer it's almost like someone like squeezed some lemon in your in your water and and put a tiny bit of alcohol in it it's really nice um so i like that they've been experimenting this way and not Mm. just making the same stuff over and over Uh, and i yeah so they've been trying all sorts of like interesting stuff like that On, on on the subject of alcohol one of the interesting points of 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 hong kong are dai pai dongs Mm -hmm. um What's the culture behind that? I mean, how, hmm. how, what's, what's so the um, the sort of the name Dai Pai Dong. A lot of people say um, it came from the fact that so Dai is big, Pai is like a sign or a license, and yeah. Dong is a stall. So it, these are street stalls traditionally, and people say that it's called Dai Pai Dong because they used to ha- hang a big their license to operate. They used to hang them in a prominent place because when the British were starting to govern Hong Kong. Um, they, you know, British people, I guess in the, in Europe, they weren't used to, or they, yeah, they weren't used to having street stalls and street life in the same way that Asia, much of Asia does. So they thought of it as unhygienic and they regulated, really tried to regulate um, all the street life. So one way was to give issue licenses to street vendors. <laughs> so, um, and you had to display your license to show that you were allowed to operate and do what you say you're gonna do. So apparently that's that's how Dai Pai Dongs came about. And usually, I mean, Dai Pai Dongs could have been, these days we associate it with like some you know, huge woks and stir fries and right. um, that kind of, that kind of like stir fried food, I guess. But it could have, it could be anything. Anything could be a street stall. Um, in there's not very many of them left. And actually, this is also a remnant of British the British rule. 
um, they because they wanted to eventually get rid of street stalls because mm. they found it unhygienic and like uncivilized, I uncouth. guess. Uncouth. Uncouth, yeah, exactly. You know, the kind of, or the natives, they're so uncouth. <laughs> um, so they wanted to get rid of them, but they couldn't just put like a, a ban on them because people would revolt. Like this is people's livelihoods. That's how they yeah. make money. That's how they feed their children, yeah. send them to school, etc. So they put in a sort of, like a sunset clause into the law where um, for the most part, Dai Pai Dongs are not allowed to pass their license. They're not allowed to sell their licenses. Okay. The license is attached to the owner, not a business and not the stall. So if that owner gets old and wants to retire or they pass away, they're not allowed. That means their shop closes with them. So that's their way of like a natural dying of dying off of street stalls. Recently, it's been changed so that I think there are a couple of changes. One is that they could pass it on to a family member. So if they have, you know, a son or daughter or a wife or something, they could pass it on to them so that the Dai Pai Dong can continue. Um, I think, but that's only a fairly recent um, development. So I think Dai Pai Dong's, I can't remember exactly the statistics, but there used to be thousands. They used to be like everywhere because that's how the, mm. one of the main ways people found food. Um, but they started to die off. And then in central, I think the central district council, um, kind of petitioned the government to say that Dai Pai Dongs are part of what draws tourists to central. Cause you know, there's a, there's a really famous strip on Stanley street and there's a couple up Elgin street as well in central. So they're saying like, oh, this is really important for tourism. And mm. when it's tourism, the government understands because that's tourism dollars. If you tell them it's about culture and stuff, it's like too frothy basically. So they had to say it was tourism. And then they were like, okay, then we'll let them stay. Which like, there are probably like 20 of them that have been allowed to stay and pass it on, pass the license on to um, someone in the family. But before that was in place, basically thousands of Dai Pai Dongs had been closed down or had closed down throughout Hong Kong uh, for years because they'd been in this sort of natural dying process. So it wasn't till that that people realized that they were losing something culturally. Uh, so yeah, um, but in these days, like if you look at Stanley Street, there is, I think, are you talking Stanley Market? No, no, no okay. Stanley oh, Street right, and Central. Okay. So oh, near yes, the escalators. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, near the escalators. Mm -hmm. um, there's one like below the escalators, <coughs> and then on Elgin Street on oh, the corner. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and on the corner of Elgin and Hollywood Road, yeah. there's a famous one that's known for just noodles and sweet soups, like dessert. Mm. So it's not all just stir fries and things. Uh, it is convenient that a lot of stir fry ones are outside because of ventilation and so on. And a lot of them, you can see the their gas stoves. I think they're gas stoves. The fire, the flames are huge. Like basically, they f they stir fry on top of this giant, like it's like a pit of fire, <laughs> and Christ. and it's so hot. And you, the only thing stopping between you and the fire is that wok. That mm -hmm. walk that fits perfectly into that yeah. hole. Yeah. And so imagine the guy frying the food. Like he's <laughs> just, in, like, yeah, they're crazy. They're like asbestos hands or something. So, uh, but that is like really, and that sort of super hot wok frying is a, it ref, it's reflected in the flavor as well. It comes through in the flavor when you have that sort of intense charring and intense heat. Um, that's an effect that, cooks call the Maillard reaction. So it's like caramelizing anything. It can be meat, it can be, it can be a starch. Vegetables, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It basically, that caramelization is essential to great flavor. And that's why, for example, if you steam a steak, it's not gonna be as tasty as if you pan fry a steak. Because when you pan fry, well, you don't eat steak. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but, but just as an example. So, so how does it work? Does it so when it, um, so basically when you have a high heat, kind of a very hot surface yeah, yeah. or a very hot, like a flame. Yeah. And the surface of your, um, steak. Uh, your steak or any food. Yeah. And it comes into contact. It sort of, it caramelizes the surface. Oh. And it creates 
you know, a typical, like if you look at an egg in a pan, you get that brown yeah. rim. That's caramelization happening, right? Or even turning golden brown and then it turns a dark brown and if it goes too far, it's black. So it's really about judging at which point of that caramelization you want to take the egg off. But you need that caramelization for flavor, for like really good, it's the Japanese call it umami. It's a, it's called That's the- MSG. It is it? MSG, exactly, it's MSG. It is, they call it the fifth flavor. So you yeah. have like, you know, saltiness, sweetness, sour, bitter, and then umami. Umami is that flavor of, it's like a meatiness, but it doesn't have to come from meat. Um, anything, most base sauces that people love have natural MSG in them. Um, ketchup, like cooked down tomatoes, basically, has a ton of MSG in it. Um, natural, naturally occurring MSG. Um, dried seaweed that the Japanese use, like kombu, that they use for their base soups. Um, soy sauce. Soy sauce is a typical, like, again, it's to add that twang umami. of okay. umami in mm. it. And that's the breakdown of soybeans. So I think it's kind of called like the release of the amino acids as it breaks down. Mm. And that umami or MSG is basically like a ch chain of amino acids. And that's what you're tasting. And that is also what is created during the Maillard reaction, the, the pan frying reaction. You create that change in the amino acid chains so that and you taste oh, it. And I that's see. the umami flavor you get. So the cooking method is as important as the condiments and things you put in to create the umami. I see. And so stir frying is a great way to create lots of umami because everything's chopped quite um, small. So your sort of surface area to volume ratio of charred edges is quite high. So it gets it. So it, when it goes into your mouth, it's like super tasty. You get all these, all these like a lot that's of umami. That's just fascinating. <laughs> so that's why I like tau fun fried yes. rice so much. Yes. Compared that, to say steamed rice, yeah. steamed rice is boring. Tao fan is is exciting. <laughs> yeah, and of course, like tao fan, you can add condiments. You know, you can usually sure. in yeah. uh, you know soy sauce and and uh, sesame oil, which is great for like lifting the aromas. Um, but also the cooking method because the starches have been charred slightly. You mm. might not be able to see it, but you can like if you use a microscope, you could probably see like little bits of charring on on each bit each, each of the bits of the rice. Fascinating, mm. fascinating. Now there's there's a special kind of seaweed that's in Japan. I think you can only get it in Japan. And you, you go diving and you put it up in the little bubbles. Do, uh, do you grapes. know what I'm... Sea grapes. Do what? they look like tiny yeah. strings of grapes? Yeah, ki kind of. What's, what's the story there? I hear that this thing is like a magic food or something. Well, is it? I mean, a lot of things are called superfoods. In Okay, in yeah. What is a superfood? It's a marketing term. Is, is bullshit. Bullshit, yeah. I would say ignore it. <laughs> it's just a marketing term. Like, I think okay. going back again. So this it, is Jamie Oliver pushing his... His, his, his uh, real food. <laughs> I mean, I'm as much as Jamie Oliver has kind of flooded our media, it's probably overexposed. I do agree with his, with his sort of central idea that you should just eat real whole foods. I you agree. know, um, it's, it's pretty simple, actually. But yeah, so... Um, what were you saying? Sea grapes. Yeah. It's, it's a type of seaweed, basically. In the ocean, there's like grass, the equivalent of grass, um, as you would on land. So there's a million types of grass and a million types of, you know, as you can imagine, like you have your smaller plants, you have your giant ferns, you have, you know, oak trees a thousand years old. You have similar things in the ocean. So that's all your like ocean greenery, I guess. And mm. that... I think it's not um, is not only found in Japan, but it is especially common. I think in Okinawa, in the southern part of Japan, and probably possibly in Taiwan because they basically share the same part of the ocean. Um, and yeah, it's found a lot there. And it has this. So each grape, I guess this. If you, it's like a microscopic sea, a grape, a string of grapes. Mm. And when you bite into them, they kind of burst each time, right? And it's kind of like eating caviar or, yeah, like every time you bite into it, it bursts with a little bit of like salty seawater, um, but with a lot of umami as well, like that fresh flavor we were talking about. So 
seaweed usually has a lot of natural MSG in it, which is why the Japanese use dried seaweed for their soups, um, the broths um, called dashi. So they use, um, usually use kombu, which is a type of thick seaweed, and they also sometimes use um, dried fish, dried bonito flakes right. to create that richness that becomes the base of a lot of different dishes from your, you know, ramen soup to your daily, like, broth that you're using to poach some vegetables just to give it like a lift of flavor right 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 right, right. how did we but, get to this topic <laughs> you know oh no oh no no because i was just thinking of it um yeah i'm just thinking of of, of that because yeah. you, you you seem to be well you are very knowledgeable so i'm thinking of these like little questions i can <laughs> yeah, ask yeah, what's, what's going on ask and, me all the questions uh, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 um but hey, i want to get into uh, like miso miso soup Mm-hmm. What is the story? What it you, miso? Because like like I'm finding like I can ask these and I'm getting really good responses, which means it's like, I mean, that's so you know, I don't know, I don't know if you find this, but I when I meet people, like I'm mm. a, quite an introvert, but I like I actually do like talking to people, but I find meeting people very very awkward because yeah. there's so many kind of very superficial things that you say to people, but I find that one way I get around it now as an older person, I can now say I, I found some tricks, um, is that you can kind of ask them like, what's your thing? Like, what are you super into? So some people yeah. are like super into like computers or en- like engineering or aircraft. Yeah. Um, I'm my thing. One of my big things is food. That's why I'm like, I love everything about, <laughs> I can, I, and I've, throughout through the years i've like read a ton of books and stuff about food because yeah. i'm just naturally i naturally gravitate towards it so back to your miso question yeah so miso actually chinese people have a version of it as well it's called bean paste or soybean paste it is basically originally a byproduct of soy sauce okay so when you make soy sauce it's like soybeans and then you add a culture to like start to break it down and then you put some brine so um, salt and water and you just wait traditionally you wait and it just stays out in these you can still see it in Hong Kong there's um, soy sauce makers in Hong Kong there's these giant vats that just sit in the sun for like three months as the 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 yeast and the different cultures are breaking down the soy bean the soybean and releasing all these amino acids to create flavor and color and all of that so what you have left is like the residue of soy and salt at the Ooh, bottom of the okay. of the vat. So once you you kind of skim off the initial um, soy sauce, that first skimming, that first brew is seen to be the best soy sauce because it has like a lot of flavor. It's like a first press olive oil, like it's seen to be the best flavor. Some places in order to um, get more out of the soybeans, they just pour more brine into that batch where the soybeans still are, like this half disintegrated soybeans, and they brew another batch. And that's your second tier soy sauce that maybe you would use for cooking, but not for dipping. So Mm. if it's dipping, it's a much more direct thing. So you use the best soy sauce you can. So anyway, after all of that, you have this broken down layer of like soy mush. That's miso, like traditionally. These days, Usually people make miso separately in order to have better control of the flavors um, because usually by then your soy beans have like given all they can give, right? They're mm. spent mm. and you don't have as rich a flavor as you want from like a miso product. So that nowadays from, to my knowledge anyway, miso is made separately. Um, and then, then you get a byproduct, which is like maybe not a not so good soy sauce or something, and they use it in in different ways. Um, but yeah, that's what it is. It's just like mushed up, broken down soy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so recently, we purchased um, a pasta making machine. Mm. Had have you used it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you like it? It's it's fantastic. Well, okay. Uh, I th- I think it's definitely an art. You have to you have to. There's a lot of things that you have to get right and, and refine. Mm. But hell, it's a lot better than buying um, the stuff from uh, from the shops. Yeah. Do, do you have fresh, a... Fresh yeah. pasta? I yeah. don't have a pasta machine because, okay. as you probably know, um, it takes a lot of space to roll out oh, dough. Shit. Oh, shit. And to, like, you've got to roll it out and then you've got to pass it through the machine to roll it out further. 
And it just gets then, longer and longer, and it's like you take the whole table kind yes, of thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like this yeah. entire table that you know. Easily. It will, it, so I don't, I don't have that kind of space in my house. Like yeah. you're lucky that you do. <laughs> and also, after you like have have flattened it and then maybe cut it into strips, you need to kind of hang them around for a little while. To Why? Dry Why do off. you have to do that? So the the some of the moisture has to dry off just a little bit mm. because otherwise, if you try and cook it right away, it will be mushy. That's what that's what my pasta was. Okay. You need to let it um, oh, just in in Hong Kong because it's so humid. It's even better if you can put it next to like a fan or something, just some air to right. take away the moisture. Okay. Because otherwise, you're just putting dough in some water. That's basically oh, I that, which is why it's mushy. See. You can imagine okay. that, right? If yeah. I took some dough and just put it in some water, yeah, it would just yeah, disintegrate. Yeah. Right. Um, that's why you need to let it hang. So a lot of people will use. Um, Clothes drying racks or something, and just hang their pasta there for a what, couple coat, hours. Coat hangers and coat hangers, and oh. even like a big, you know, those big clothes dryers that like, like a rack. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Any, yeah, anything yeah. you have, coat hangers are fine. Yeah, okay. Um, it, it just depends on what space you have, but yeah, I've seen people use coat hangers, and you just you just hang it there for a couple hours so that it dries off. The surface dries off a little bit because. Mm. So people like fresh pasta because it's so much more tender usually. Mm. And yes, you want that, but you don't want it to be mush either, which is why yeah. you have to dry it off a little bit, just to yeah. take off the initial moisture. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I think to me, I love fresh pasta as well, but it depends on what I'm cooking or what I feel like. Because sometimes I like the sort of the bite that dried pasta gives you. Um, and if I'm, if especially if it's a... I don't know something that has more chunky things i would usually prefer it actually with a firmer pasta if it's more of a like a slow cooked sauce that really sticks to the pasta then a fresh pasta which usually if it's made at home or made by hand has again if you use a microscope it would have like rougher edges and so that clings to the sauce better and then you can deliver more salt. It's a better delivery mode to get it into your mouth, right? Okay. So that's, yeah, so it really depends what I'm eating. So I like both fresh and, and dried. Right. Yeah, but yeah, it's, how often do you make pasta then? Um, well, we've only had it for about, uh, about three weeks now, so... You've been using, we, you're, you're in that stage where you're still using it quite a lot. I've seen people... <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like the bread a, machine, right? Yes, the bread yeah. maker. You, you start making that thing. You're like, yeah, I, I just keep I on love, going. And the smell of fresh bread is amazing. Yeah. It fills yeah, the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I would encourage you definitely to keep to keep making it. And you can yeah. get better and better at it as well because, you know, you learn tips and tricks yeah, along the way. Yeah. You learn what you like. And also the recipes differ. Some people put full eggs. Some people only put egg yolks. Some people don't put, um, I think, don't put eggs at all and just do flour and water. Mm. Um, there's all sorts of ways. And because Italy, like we were saying before, each village has their own specialties. They mm. also have their own like pasta shapes and um, ways of making um, pastas that, mm. you know, there's a really good, I don't know if you're in, on Instagram, but if you are, look up an account called Pasta Grannies. It's just grannies okay. around Italy, all from all these diverse villages, making their super local version of pasta. <laughs> and they're just like, there's these little video clips of them like making these shapes you've never seen before and names that you've never heard of before. It's great. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> well, that's lovely. Yeah. It's yeah. lovely. And this is this sort of stuff, it's great now that we have, you know, easy access to media creation. Right. Like even what we're doing now yeah, you know, yeah. would have been unimaginable yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. But well, now you can need, yeah. preserve this sort of culture through video and you know, one day these grannies might pass away and inevitably. Um, but with these videos, if we wanted to recreate some of this, we could. Yeah. And so that's that's a really great thing, I think. Mm, yeah. Because if you look at, say, um, like, you know, ancient Romans, like we all want to know how they ate. So then yeah. um, people like archaeologists are looking through their uh, remains, you know, bones and stuff to figure out how they ate, where they ate. And, and um, they're going through their kitchen, like in places like Pompeii and Herculaneum, they're going through their kitchen stuff mm. and trying to see what they ate. 
if there was video technology then we would know exactly we could keep all the recipes and still <laughs> like you know use them and and yeah there are people actually who do that who look up like these ancient ancient recipes yeah. and try and recreate them now well wasn't there a, a maze that was found in in the mayan um in south america because of the mayan culture mm -hmm. and they found that this particular maze was like so much more rich in in um yeah. Yeah, like the native type of maze, right? Yeah, so, right. Um, that's something that's interesting that also everything has brought us back to industrial agriculture, actually. So a lot of what's happened is that these native varieties have been bred out because maybe they weren't as productive, even though they're higher. They're, maybe they're more nutrient dense. Maybe they taste better, but their yields might be lower or they might oh, require a lot of input be it labor or water or whatever else. Mm. And as, as industrialization became, I guess, more and more important, um, these were gradually bred out and, these, and they ended up with varieties that were maybe less nutritious, maybe less taste, less flavor, but much easier to grow and maybe more calorie dense even um, because that, I guess, at that point, the you know human survival could finally like when if you look at agriculture basically humans went from foraging and hunting to being able to create civilizations because of agriculture because they were able to produce enough food for everyone and they weren't they also weren't spending all their time foraging and hunting they could do other things like create technologies or create literature because of agriculture, because of specialization, basically, of, of food production. So in some ways, we wouldn't have had, you know, Romans and all until us, you know, cultures, civilizations, if we didn't have agriculture. But we're at the point in history now, I think, that agriculture is doing more harm than it is good to us. And we have to figure out what we're going to do in the future, because the maze that you talked about um, I think a lot of it is like native to South America and I think a lot of native foods have I think it's just through evolution have been very nutritious for people but because our f the focus of humankind was to was to sort of expand and become less reliant on un unreliable food sources they wanted agriculture so of course they wanted things that they could control so it's always a balance, you know, of course we can't go back to foraging and hunting 100% because then we'd have no technological advancement, we'd have no more, you know, civilizations. But we also can't just let this industrial thing go too far because we've bred things to the point where we're not getting nutrition from it. Like corn these days is not, does not have nutrition in it. It's just starch, it's like sugar, it's empty food. So we need to find yeah we need to go back a little bit and find like how do we keep food nutrient dense but also feed everyone and yeah it's like it's like the body's hardwired for you know sugar mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. um so as a result it's like that's one of the things that we derive a lot of pleasure from yes exactly so, yes yeah, so as a result we just like okay well let's engineer this problem and now we know we're eating like straight yeah, yeah. Fructose and it's like having like <laughs> dopamine hits yeah. every time. Yeah, exactly. It's an addiction. Like it there is, are yeah. people who talk yeah, about this, sugar as an addiction. This is this, right? is, this is the thing. It's like yeah. apparently the, um, the we're in a sugar crisis at the moment. I mean, there's a if you look at the the, the brain like uh, cat scans or something. Yeah, like yeah. Apparently, it's like the, the areas that light up in in the brain are the same as heroin yeah. addicts. Kind of yeah, yeah, it's addiction. Um, yeah. I think a lot of foodstuffs actually have that addictive effect, like that we think are not harmful, actually. Yeah. We've gone to the point where some of these things are harming us, like yeah. sugar. Yeah. Or, I mean, and everyone's reactions are slightly different as well. Like some people are extra sensitive to sugar, some mm. people are not. Um, and then you have, yeah, so there's a whole, you know, plethora of health issues that have come out of basically lifestyle issues or like diet issues and i know there's like an unhealthy obsession with the idea of a diet you know people are like i need to lose weight and uh, i need to like look fit or something but that that's not what i mean by diet what i mean is a diet as in a an overview of what you eat in a day um so 
if you look at the way people in industrialized worlds eat, we eat a lot of processed food. So of course we have lifestyle diseases coming out of eating like too much refined sugar. And, and then you have people with more and more allergies as well. I think that is somehow related to the way that food has been sort of fractionalized now into these just, just very simple, like a simple carb that is just carbohydrate and nothing else and no other like micronutrients. Because if you look at the maize from the Mayans, corn was not just starch. It probably had all sorts of micronutrients in it. It probably had minerals mm. in it from, that pulled up from the soil. That's what I mean by a nutrient-dense food. It's mm. not because right now we're like, oh, okay, I'm going to have a corn-based, like just horrible like fast food thing, a bun that's just made out of corn starch and high fructose corn syrup. And then I'm feeling like unhealthy, so I'm gonna like pop a few supplement pills to get my vitamins, you know, vitamin C or vitamin D or whatever. That's that's not. I think there's a problem with that. Like I think even in um, the world of nutrition, like nutritionists will always say that if you can get your nutrients from a whole food rather than supplements, then you should do that mm. because a whole food is. Um, for example, say like an orange has a certain amount of vitamin C in it, but it also has fiber. It also has sugar. It's a package. It's like nature's own package of vitamins, minerals, um, and everything you need. Like not everything, but you know, the components of um, things that our body can use. If you go out and eat fiber separately as a thing, like eat some tree bark, okay? Fiber, and then you take a vitamin C pill. That combination, might be out of whack. Like the, the amount of fiber versus the, um, the dosage of vitamin C might not actually be the best um, way for your body to process. Because your body doesn't process these things kind of as single blocks. They, it processes food as a whole. So you have, for example, if you separated everything and you had like a spoon of fiber and like popped a vitamin C pill, maybe you've overdone the vitamin C per given the amount of fiber you've had. Maybe you need more fiber to bulk it up or to, to dilute the vitamin C basically. Um, so yeah, that's why nutritionists usually recommend if possible to get your vitamins, minerals, everything through whole foods rather than um, like processed or supplements. Yeah, you read the China study, did you? Remind me. So the China study is about it's about the diet in China. Specifically, it was primarily uh, meat-free. Mm, yes. And uh, basically, the, the, the essence is the you know, whole foods. Um, and like vegetable-based. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, okay, so I think that's really interesting because a lot of nutrition studies, nutrition studies are notoriously difficult to run yeah. because you can't keep people in a lab you can't, um, you know, you, they're not lab mice. You can't put things in them to test them every minute of every day. And also the data collection. So data collection methods can be faulty. So a, lo a lot of nutrition studies rely on memory recall. So right. they just give them a questionnaire and say like, you know, how many meals did you have today? How, how many bowls of vegetables do you think you had? And these are always, that's always a faulty method of data collection because you, you're using, people's memories are not, are not you know, carbon copies of what actually yeah. happened. It's mm. what they think happened. Or they have this sort of perception bias. You know, they want to pretend they're more healthy or something, whatever. Or eat less. Or, or, eat, or think like they that. eat less than they yeah. have because they've forgotten that they had a snack in between or yeah. something. So for reasons like this, Nutrition studies, I always say, take nutrition studies with a grain of salt, not literal salt, but salt, <laughs> um, because they, the, it is very difficult to collect good data, high quality data from nutrition studies. It's not like a lab environment where you do, you know, metals or something. You can't, yeah. you can't control that. So I think, yes, the China study, I feel like a lot, there are, for every study that says you should eat more vegetables, there's a study there's that says you should eat more opposite. meat. Yeah. And that's yeah. why in the news that you, you have a lot of weird reporting like, oh, chocolate is good for you or coffee helps cure Alzheimer's. Like this, 
sort of reporting I find very irresponsible because usually they take it from one study maybe the n is low like they don't care like they don't talk about this stuff in the and this is mainstream reporting like you have regular people who aren't used to reading journal articles mm. reading it going like oh my god chocolate's good for me i'm gonna go out and buy you know stacks of cadbury's it's not like that and also they might not be talking about chocolate they might be talking about cacao processed a certain way or coffee in a certain dosage like what's the dose everything can be poison at the wrong dose like water can be poison at the wrong dose, you know? So yeah. that's why I think nutrition studies are interesting. I love reading them, um, but I'm always very careful to interpret that in and, and try and apply, like so a lot of people try and apply that to their daily lives as a result of reading a study. You really need scientists to help you dissect that. I can tell you that most actual scientists will be super careful about all of these studies. It's the pseudoscientists that get all like, oh my god, you know, did you know copper helps like, you know, uh, purify your water or something? Like, because they read one study and maybe f that study was funded by the Copper Association. <laughs> but people don't, you know, because they're not used to that environment, they're not always reading that way. So I think, yeah, definitely take nutrition studies with a grain of mm, salt. Mm, mm. Yeah. Janice, do you have any like favorite food yourself? I mean, like, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I think. What, what would it be? So, I have to go back to that flavor and memory thing. I think most people, for their favorite foods, they will associate it with their childhood foods. Unless they had a traumatic childhood, then they would hate their childhood foods. Yeah. It's a lot to do with memory. So, I am very lucky in that my family, especially on my mother's side, are amazing cooks and they love cooking as well. They love cooking, they love shopping for ingredients, like that whole culture of food. So, to me, Cantonese home cooked food is sort of my favorite. Um, things like steamed fish or um, just plain rice with a bit of soy sauce and a, and a fried egg, crispy around the edges, a little bit gooey inside. That's, that's sort of, that's my thing. Um, and, and then after that, I think after Cantonese food, because that's what I grew up with, um, probably Italian, um, a lot of the sort of wintry, Aut aut autumnal actually autumn foods in Italy that are very um, stew based um, slow cooked meats um, like tomato based sauces to a little bit of tomato but like a lot of like really slowly cooked so-called cheap cuts of meat because I love I actually love cheap cuts of meat because so they usually they're cheap because they're they're tough right they're usually the most worked muscles um, and or places that are a bit hard to cook because they've got bones on or something. But when you slow cook them, they I just feel like they release a lot of flavor and texture as well. I think it's all that connective tissue and that gooiness, that stickiness spreads to the rest of the meat, like the le wraps around the lean meat. Um, and, and as you cook it, it kind of, the flavors start to meld along with like herbs and garlic and things that you cook with it, onions and like maybe a little bit of tomato paste or something to give that extra punch of umami. That, like a ragu and some f fresh pasta, that's like, that's like people say, like, I, I probably shouldn't say this anymore, but like death row meal basically. <laughs> <laughs> and that and like a good glass of wine or something. That, that's, that's really, yeah. I, and I love, I love winter foods because I think I just love cold weather. Um, and I love the coziness that you feel like when you eat like a bowl of pasta like that and maybe ideally there's a fire roaring and um, and you're just you know snuggled up and wearing thick socks and some really cozy pajamas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's right. like my favorite, one of my favorite kind of imaginary scenes in winter that I would do. <laughs> Well, I think you've got something like that coming up in New Zealand, don't you? Yeah, I mean, winter in New Zealand um, gets is pretty quite cold. cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and there's snow. So, yeah, and I love, I love cooking in that environment as well because when you're on the stove, like near the stoves, you're mm. quite warm. Mm. Um, and like, whereas in Hong Kong, you try and cook in the summer and you're next to a stove, even if you have the air yeah. con going, mm. it's hot. It's, and mm. you're just sweating nonstop. So I find that a bit a bit tough um but yeah winter i love winter and and maybe because of all these sort of other sensory memories therefore i love winter food as well i got you yeah. i got you yeah 
Well, fascinating. <laughs> Any other sort of like um, areas within within uh, like you know Hong Kong food or even outside of Hong Kong that you probably want to highlight or mention uh, something of interest? Mm. Uh, is there anything out there? Or maybe you want to plug like for example the Tongzhong markets, the, the times, when and where? Yeah. Um, um, so. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'd love to. So Tongchong Street Market is going to be coming back in November and it's going to be so it's in Taiku Place in Quarry Bay where okay. the all the uh, commercial office blocks are. Yeah. So it's going to be it used to be on the weekends, but now for the new season, it's going to be Monday to Friday and it's just going to be there continuously every Monday to Friday. Um, for like people who work around there, or if you live around there, it's really easy to ah, drop by and get lunch. Ah, I see. So um, that's kind of the it's been there's been a shift slightly in the sort of audience that we were targeting, I guess. Um, Why? What happened? Um, I think not like well uh, weekends. I think with ho- things happening in Hong Kong, like a lot of um, you know with the protests and with um, people like going out less for leisure i think weekends because weekends are basically like okay. a leisure audience um whereas monday to friday you have your core kind of office audience yeah. and i think it's a good thing as well because we're reaching a completely different it's pretty different segment um because previously in the weekends you have people who probably weren't familiar with that area coming on purpose as an event but now here we have already like a captive audience that um, and also you can introduce them to like new food and beverage ideas mm. um, and the new businesses. And also, I think the market really has a strong focus on sustainability and how people can try and be more conscious of what they're eating. So, for example, offering more plant-based or vegetarian options because meat has a heavier footprint on the environment. Um, and, and through that, through food kind of, soft educating people is it's the best way because people are having delicious food and yeah and and you're kind of telling a message telling a story at the same time so yeah that's that's the main thing um so it's starting november and it will go on till february and okay. each month there's a different theme so the first month um, i believe the theme is coffee so we're going to have some good local like cafes um serving some like single origin coffees and things like that can i get can i buy the raw coffee beans i think you can yeah it depends on yeah. the vendor but i'm pretty sure um not raw but like roasted coffee beans oh roasted then, sorry roasted yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i mean <laughs> raw no, is, is like you're gonna roast yeah, it at home yeah no, but, no, um, no yeah, it's probably okay, roasted okay, okay, and okay. and then you can take it home and grind it and yeah. you know, make a coffee um yeah. so that's going to be november to february yeah and Excellent. Yeah. And then you said each theme. So the, the other themes have not been decided um, on yet. I think they have. But discussed. actually, to be honest, because I, I oh, like, had a hand in starting it, but I don't run it anymore. Really? <laughs> yeah, I consult. Oh. I consult. Like, I'm still, um, like, I'm in constant contact with the team. It's actually um, run by Swire Properties now. Well, I mean, it has always been. Um, and I help consult on how to choose, like, good vendors. Like, we get, we have an open call for applications every year, which is just closed. So the applications come in, and I help take a look at them and think, oh, this one's good, or this one's not so great. So I pick out, I help them kind of pick out some of the, some of the vendors. Um, and What are you looking for in vendors? That's a good question. Um so because there's this focus on sustainability, I'm, we're always looking for vendors who have a sort of that mindset. So either, even if they're not like a vegetarian restaurant, maybe they have some veggie options um, and their packaging, we want to we want to see if their packaging is, you know, is it plastic free? Is it um, a product that can be composted? Um, or do they welcome reusables? Like if people bring their own lunchbox, will they fill it? Because some restaurants are a bit iffy about that and some are welcoming of that. And they will maybe give people a discount for bringing your own box, um, things like that. Mm. Um, and also just for interesting food trends that are happening. So like actually things like, for example, like with coffee, um, we're looking for some really like boutique coffee roasters that, that really choose good beans like good uh, and care about the origin of their beans because coffee and tea are something and chocolate as well are some things that um 
the actually industries that are rife with、um, like ethical labor issues. They use a lot of low, low kind of、uh, wage labor, almost slave labor.、Um, some places even used to use like child labor and things like that. So we try and make sure that, for example, if a cafe is coming and they they ro- they are a roaster. We want to see that their their beans are coming from an ethical source or a transparent source at least.、Um, I think transparency is something that's quite important in this sort of sustainability story, because nothing. I mean, very few things can be like zero carbon footprint. That's just not. Just us humans existing on Earth is not zero carbon footprint.、Mm. But if we can. Because the food chain now is so complicated and convoluted, if we can have more transparency, we can be better at governing it. We can be better at making sure things like slave labor doesn't happen,、um, and people are you know being paid an adequate wage, or they're not using they're not overusing pesticides, or、um, when they say they say they're organic but actually they're using synthetic like stuff, additives, all of this stuff. There's all these really opaque corners of food production, and that is that is directly impacting things like climate change. So if we have more transparency, we can tackle these much better. We can at least see the problems first. That's the main thing. Like you can't tackle a problem until you like see it. <laughs> Do you not think it's a good idea to take this as a blueprint and try to roll it out into more places? Because it, because、yeah. it sounds like you've got a situation where, if you can educate your 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 group of people, for example, here in Quarry Bay,、um, you know they start to understand more. Okay, this is, this is where the food, the food comes from here, and and it's more sustainable this way. Are you、yeah. in this process? I'm yeah. Like I'm actually oftentimes people do reach out、um, and want to do things that are similar, or at least on the surface similar to. Hong Kong Street Market, but one thing that they may be not as prepared for in Hong Kong anyway is that you actually need a big budget for this to happen. It's not a you need, you need a swire purse. Even other developers, I think sometimes I've had brief talks to some of them, and as soon as they realize that this is like marketing budget, this is not a leasing opportunity. This is not how you get rent, like. Get more rent from people because of you ho- because of hosting stalls. Because a lot of people think that host、uh, these stalls,、uh, co- they are a way of collecting rent for the developer.、Mm. I can tell you definitely for Tong Chong Street Market, it is an expense. It is purely like CSR, like community building. It is not a way for them to make money. It is a, it's costs a lot, and people when they hear that, other companies, other You know, organizations, developers. I think when they hear that, they are not prepared for it,、um, and that's that's a issue.、Um, I mean, not an issue, but that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to roll it out、um, across Hong Kong, because Hong、mm. Kong is so much about land and rent, and、yeah. being able to、um, uh, you know ROIs on your、yeah. on your land. Well, then you should you should change the the pitch. Yeah, having the street market over here increases the prop,、uh, the value of the the. Well, the yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because someone told me sort of recently that、uh, residential towers around Taiku Place, they real estate agents now advertise the market as a plus <laughs> as a reason for moving to this area, which I think, yeah, I mean, it just shows you that it does actually, but it's such a soft and gradual sell that is. Harder to quantify that I think it makes it a harder sell to、okay. to、um, to your typical developer. I mean, and to be honest, I I haven't、um, really actively reached out to a lot of developers to to kind of try and do this.、Yeah. I've only sort of reacted to inquiries coming in,、yeah. and usually when the inquiries come in. Um, it's not necessarily from a marketing department. It might be from like a leasing department.、Mm. So their goals are different.、Mm. Their budget is coming from a different place.、Mm. Um, so yeah, it doesn't always work out. But I think it can be done. But it's not the only way of、um, like enforcing and educating sustainability、um, mm. in Hong Kong. So for example, I mean,、uh, we rank ordered all the different cities 
that we've been to, you know, just to sort of maybe we can move there. Yeah. Uh, on a, and and, and another kind of. and another axis is um is uh the features that we like. Well, it turns out that bloody market is number three on the list. It's so important. Yeah. Like like in in Lithuania, uh, was it Riga? Riga. There's a market in Riga. Mm. Holy God. Amazing. Holy God. It, it was it was truly an amazing experience yeah. that was. And I remember thinking, God, I would love to have a. You know, I'd love to live near something like this. Yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, the, the, yeah, the work that you're doing and, and the people that are also part of this uh, Tongchong market, I think it's really, really great. Yeah. And you can push it forward. Yeah, I think it's really know. important in that sort of, I mean, architects and stuff call it placemaking. You know, it really... Really? Soli- yeah, it's a term. Okay. Yeah, I know it's a fancy term, jargon. But you kind of get the idea, right? You, you create a culture yeah. by being there, like by ah, having yeah. this physical... Mm. Thing, building it it's like build it and they will come kind of thing mm. and i think markets yeah i mean melbourne has apart from all the little farmers markets in each area there's a central big market um called the queen victoria market yeah we went I to that too it's it. fantastic it's fantastic and it is a place where it's not a novelty it's not like a hipster thing you know sometimes no. farmers markets are no. seen as a yeah yeah no this is just a real this w- is a real working market <laughs> yeah. yeah with with um, you know, restaurants get their wholesale stuff there. Mm. You can buy not just food, but there are people selling, you know, electronics imported from China. <laughs> you can buy clothes. No, like, right. Not amazing clothes, but clothes. And then there's some like locally made, like, you know, maybe the, there's a glass blower there. And then mm. you also have people like making deli items. So, you know, sausages and um, even cooked food that you can just eat there, like coffee and sandwiches and things like that. And it's a really vibrant place and it is in the heart of Melbourne. It's like basically just on the edge of the city. Mm. You could walk there from the CBD. And, and that's so central to like Melbourne's culture. And Melbourne, like the food and wine culture in Melbourne is super strong, like the restaurant culture. Out of all the places in Australia, um, Melbourne has almost always been known for being having a great restaurant scene. Mm. And I think having lived in Melbourne, that is what kind of put me onto the job I have now. Like it's made me really interested in food. Initially, it was just through like reading about food because they had a section in the newspaper specifically about food once a week. Um, And I used to just pour through those pages thinking, how can people like write so much about food and write such, you know, with such passion and (laughs) it's like so lyric, like wax lyrical over some cheese. So then, and because I've always loved to like read and write and I've just thought it was such a novelty to me that people were writing these elaborate essays about a restaurant, about their night at a restaurant. So then I would go out and go to the same restaurant and kind of go, well, will I feel the same? Like, I want to check if this, oh. it's almost like fact checking, but you can't, it's subjective completely. But I, it was almost like, how, how do you feel this way from a meal? So I started following the reviewers, like, like a reviewer would review a place this Tuesday and then the next week I try and go and sort of like check them, which is a stupid like teenage thing, like kind of. I don't know, it was my way of resisting authority. It's like, you're telling me how I should think about my food. I want to see if you're right. Like, <laughs> kind of, it was a weird, it was a weird dynamic. But anyway, that was my initial, like, motivation. Oh, you're stretching your wings. You're stretching your wings at that point. Yeah. So it's, oh. yeah, it was kind of like, it was really, that's how I got into food, actually. Just by, mm. like, reading and then eating. <laughs> and that's, I didn't, so Melbourne has had this culture for quite a while. Mm. Um before i'd say even like definitely before america um europe like you know maybe continental europe had that in france especially italy people love food and they eat out at restaurants a lot but in australia i think it was mostly because we had so many italian immigrants in um in melbourne Mm. whereas other states tended to have like other ethnicities so we had a lot of italians and you know italians in their food they, um they brought a lot of that like, restaurant culture and cafe culture coffee mm. culture to to melbourne so i really think that um melbourne being in melbourne really affected how i view food i feel like australia now in general is light years ahead in terms of how they view the future of food and the future of restaurants like for example cooking with local produce like or like foraging for produce and cooking with it 
that was seen to be such a foreign concept. Um, it's funny, right? It's like full circle. People used mm. to for, like <laughs> hunter gatherers would forage, but that was like forgotten for so long. And um, in Australia, they start like you started getting people, um, you know, using really celebrating local fish or a local farm, whereas. It used to be like slightly before that. It was like if you're a French restaurant, you import everything from France. Even in America, like if you read like old New York Times um, restaurant reviews, which are kind of like the gold standard sort of of old school reviewing, there used to be restaurants that would just like basically copy menus from France, and that used to be the epitome of fine dining. And you would even import as much as you could from France. Yeah, you know, Julia Child did all that, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, she exactly. started all that. So. Yeah, so that she was more like in that home cooking front, but also, yeah, it, it cemented in people's yeah. kind of minds that you had to import something from the old country to to for it to be any good. Yeah. But Australians, I would say, were one of the first people to really break out of that and say, like, we have a great we have great agriculture in Australia, so why aren't we using more local produce? Why aren't we looking at things like native bush foods, like from Aboriginal cultures, like indigenous mm. cultures? Um, and I think I feel like Australia was actually way ahead and also pulling from immigrant cultures as well. So kind of this melting pot effect um, where you have like Chinese, a lot of Chinese people went to Australia. So if Hong Kong people went in the sort of late 80s, um, you have Vietnamese people like yeah. there's a huge Vietnamese community in Melbourne yeah. as well. Yeah. And then suddenly you have like these restaurants where they're like, oh, OK, we're going to try and put some like Vietnamese herbs into this combo and see like, you know, and, and be inspired by that. That didn't happen in the rest of the world until much later. And often the early versions of these foods were seen as like very crude mashups. It's like, oh, let's just try anything. But by then, like by the time the rest of the world was doing that, Australia had already kind of fine tuned it mm -hmm. so that they knew that it's like, okay, we've tried this weird herb and this weird meat together, um, didn't work. But the, this combination works, which is not French, like not a French or Italian or anything. It was uniquely Australian. And that started to kind of, that started to happen way before anyone else, even people talk about like California cuisine. I'm like, Ugh. We were we were there before, like and California. I find that California food and Australian like restaurant culture is actually quite similar because they they started to kind of have the same sensibilities about like using locally grown stuff, and they also have geographically similar kind of top topographically Climates. similar like okay. the ocean, right. and then they have a bit of inland and and um, wineries and stuff. So a lot of that cuisine is I find them very similar, but when like Californians say it. It's like Cal they, I think they call it Californian cuisine or something like really fresh salads and things like that um, and just really simple ingredients uh, they kind of wax lyrical about it and I'm like we were doing that like 20 years before you were <laughs> <laughs> just, it's just that Australia is so far away like like in reality but also psychologically that the the kind of powerful media conglomerates that are all based in America didn't come out to Australia so they didn't know like they it just kind of happened in their own little bubbles but yeah now people are starting to realize that but yeah I think being in Australia had I uh, had some really interesting perspective in terms of food yeah <laughs> I think we've done pretty well we've yeah done pretty well I liked you, your questions they were yeah they were all really interesting questions oh were I, they yeah like miso like a lot of people don't ask what miso is they just kind of you know i think that's the thing like people don't think about food enough and they don't ask enough questions and that's why we're in the problem well, well it's very easy to riff off you very <laughs> very easy i mean you can you can just get going I, and i can talk for like for an eternity about food <laughs> and i love it <laughs> well it's fantastic and more power to you Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, this yeah, has great. Been fun. <laughs> cool. Okay, so and then. Uh